our third meeting today. On va commencer notre troisième réunion. I know we're going to begin our third meeting. Meeting, so we're, is it your birthday? <laughs> Okay, so um, this is uh, FEDCO special meeting for the 9th of March 2020, a réunion spéciale pour uh, le, mar le 9 mars 2020. Declaration of interest. None. Uh, presentations. Uh, stage 2 LRT quarterly update. Mr. Manconi or Mr. Morgan, and I think, uh, do we have a PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Okay, so the floor is yours, and uh, we'll just hold questions until the end of the presentation. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just here to, uh, to give an update on the design construction progress for, uh, for stage two of the Trillium line, as well as stage two of the Confederation line. Uh, pleased to be here as part of this quarterly update. Uh, so just as a reminder, the, uh, the map for the, uh, the expanded network when we build it out. So 2022, I've gotten a few questions from people about whether this includes a full build out to the airport. Is it the entire system? So in 2022, after we put the system back into service, it will be the complete Trillium line, including the airport link. And then you see the dates there for uh, <clears throat> Confederation Line West 2024 and Confederation, or East 2024 and Confederation West 2025. Um, so just some of the work that's ongoing. Uh, so stage two, as we all know, 44 kilometers of new rail, 24 new stations, two maintenance and storage facilities. So we have the new maintenance and storage facility that's being built uh, out on Cork, near Corkstown Road in Moody, in that general area. We also have the new Walkley Road uh, MSF that's being built. So we'll have three maintenance facilities for the new trains once stage two is completed. The budget of 4.66 billion, and then the three lines and the three opening dates that I discussed. Uh, just in, in the summary, you know, a lot of uh, people ask about the full build out of the network. So 64 kilometers when we're finished, 41 stations, 85 vehicles, including the, uh, the six existing Alstom, seven new Stadler, and the remaining made up of the uh, Alstom Citadus vehicles. And then the, the build out of the network at the end of 2025 is 64 kilometers. Uh, roughly 75 to 80 percent of the entire build-out uh, plan. Um, stage three takes us to that ultimate build-out, but uh, this is certainly good, uh, good progress towards, uh, towards that work. Um, just a little bit about the impacts. Um, so I'll talk a little bit in a second about the, uh, the economic impacts, the number of people that you see on the street. But as we have talked about previously, 77 percent of people uh, within five kilometers of new rail, uh, 110,000 tons of GHGs being eliminated, and creation of 27,000 person years of employment. So just, uh, so right now, uh, people, residents will see a couple of major uh, new, new sites, construction sites that have started up. You've got a big set of trailers near Baseline Station. You've got a big set of trailers near Montreal Road Interchange. Uh, you know, there have been several hundred people here uh, in Ottawa on site working on construction. Uh, but later this year, Transit Next will have approximately 700 people working on the project across that line. Um, and then resources will peak at roughly 1,600 by the end of the summer. Um, so for this year alone, $48 million in services to be procured. So I'm having clicker problems. You do it? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit of background. So this is a, a financial table that we include in the quarterly memo that goes out. The next one is due to go out in the next week or so. Um, just gives you a sense of, uh, for stage two, we switched to an earn value model as opposed to a, uh, a milestone model that we used in stage one. So on a monthly basis, we receive uh, earn value payments uh, submissions that are uh, provided by the two teams. Uh, the independent certifier actually validates that the work uh, that they're claiming has been completed, that's in the ground. So this is a, some of its design work, some of its construction in the ground. Um, but to date, just on the Confederation alone, uh, we've paid out over $300 million. Um, on the Trillium Line contract, 
this, the Trillium Line contract actually had a $69 million initial capital investment as part of the P3, so they had to do $69 million worth of work uh, validated by the independent certifier prior to us making any construction period payments. So they've made, uh, they've achieved the $69 million and there's another $35 million of design and construction work essentially completed. So they're over $100 million into their project against $636 million during the, uh, the construction period payment. Uh, there was a question earlier about uh, stage two as it relates to the work that RTG's done. Uh, obviously, the, the $500 million uh, variation to their contract was let uh, a couple of years ago. Um, that included roughly $100 million for them to expand the maintenance uh, building, but it also includes the stage two, uh, stage two vehicles. Um, so there was a large mobilization fee, and they're slowly working through that, uh, that contract uh, we had a, a couple of engineers from our team go to the Brampton facility just to kind of get a sense of the work that was happening there. And so uh, the next set of vehicles starting at uh, 48 and above are underway in Brampton. Um, they've indicated early indications that we should actually see the first delivery from Brampton site uh, kind of late spring, early summer. Um, so that'll be a uh, you know, very visible presence as you see that vehicle wrapped up and uh, on basically a flatbed truck coming to the, uh, the maintenance facility where they're going to break it up in two pieces, put it back together, put those two pieces back together at the, uh, the maintenance facility at Belfast, and then it'll be put on the line for the dynamic testing. So a lot of work uh, underway there with, uh, with the Stage 2 vehicle contract. Uh, so just quickly give you some updates on the, the Trillium line, the progress we're making there. Um, so construction drawings, uh, a big activity that's happening this year is the uh, work at the airport station. Um, we actually had to close a, a loading dock at the airport facility. Um, we have an agreement with the airport to close a road that approaches the, the loading dock for a large, the better part of this year to get in, do our work and get out of the way. Um, so that work is underway. We've all already closed the loading dock and we're doing early mobilization at that site. Uh, but we do have the, uh, the construction drawings well in hand to be able to, to start that work. Final designs. Trillium Line is really marked by uh, a number of rail over road uh, grade separations. The, the Confederation Line is more road over rail. In, on the Trillium Line, it's rail over road. Um, so a lot of these, uh, these structures are, are, are in the ground or the, their final designs for the piers and the pier caps and the girder structures are underway. So we're making good progress there. Uh, and then in terms of kind of the designs that are coming out later, uh, some preliminary designs for a couple of, there's a couple of underpasses under the Trillium line at Carleton University. Um, so we're increasing double tracking at those locations. And so we actually have to widen or lengthen depending on the, your orientation, those structures to allow that double tracking at those locations. So that's, that's a lot of work that's gonna be happening at, at the campus once we start the, that closure. Obviously the via grade separation um, and then all the, work, uh, all the work to the south, now that the, the structures are kind of advanced uh, or to a point where they're under construction and the designs are advanced, we're into the, a point now where we're doing the final guideway, so this is the track and the switch layout um, for the Trillium Line South. Uh, and then early, very early design, preliminary designs on some of the signage work, the comm system. So as you know, for the Trillium line, we're upgrading all of the, uh, the platform signage to include uh, next, tra next train arrival information, latest emergency phones, latest CCTV cameras, um, all of the kind of security requirements that are going to uh, feed into our transit operations control center. Uh, so next, uh, next slide shows the construction schedule. And uh, just kind of in terms of the work that we've already started, a line bank to, to South Keys and the airport link. Um, obviously, you know, the beginning of May is when we're going to shut down the existing line. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this, uh, this map is basically on the precipice of having every single area of the line under construction shortly. So I'll give you a few uh, shots of some of the construction progress. So Walkley MSF, uh, so this is the maintenance and storage facility, a purpose-built facility. It needs to be in the ground right away. We've got a, we're currently operating the Trillium line out of an existing CP facility. Our lease is ending there. We need to get out of that facility and enter our new facility. So this will be one of the first kind of structures that will be fully complete. Um, a, a bunch of work that's going on at that location. Again, it's adjacent to live tracks, the existing Trillium line, and adjacent to an active uh, CEN storage yard. So uh, a lot of activity in a very confined space, but uh, they're, they're moving quickly in terms of getting uh, the foundation work done now, which I'll show you on the next slide. 
uh, foundation. So helical piles going into the ground, uh, welding cap caps being welded on top. We'll put beams across that, and that'll serve as the foundation for the structure. So that <clears throat> once they get going with those beams, that structure will come out of the ground uh, rather quickly, and it will be. Uh, it will be the place where the Stadlers and ultimately the, the Alstom links as well are maintained once we're into stage two. The next shot, just to, just to kind of give you a sense of proximity to the, uh, to the existing rail line, the active line, there's a fence there uh, between the construction site and, and the line, uh, the Trillium line vehicles as they're launched into service. So this is kind of a, and then just on the other side of that is an active CN yard um, where we're, CN does freight deliveries uh, to that location storage, but we also still have an obligation throughout the construction period to provide freight deliveries to the NRC facility uh, just, sh just south of Leicester Road, which is a very kind of a, a big logistical challenge for the project in terms of making that access available at all times or within discrete periods for the NRC. So just a summary of the construction. Um, so there's a total of 19 structures that are being new structures or, or existing structures that are being refurbished. Uh, five are essentially underway. The first four there, Airport Parkway. I'll show you some photos of that. Uplands Drive, Bozell Road, Earl Armstrong. So advanced construction, you see those coming out of the ground now. Lime Bank Road is a little bit, uh, it's not quite as advanced as the other four locations, but uh, there is active work at that location. Um, go to the next slide. So Airport Parkway, um, so you've probably seen, uh, if you drive that road, uh, you see the, on the right hand, as you're going towards the airport, the right hand side, you see the, uh, the piers and the pier cap. On the left hand side, you see uh, the pier caps I think underway now, um, but we've actually reserved space for a future widening of the airport parkway. So further to, the, as you're approaching the airport, further to the your left hand side, there's another set of uh, of columns and another pier cap that will be there to allow the the future uh, widening to happen without any impact on on the service. So we go to the next one. You can see the uh, the pier cap underway, the photo of it. So there's the, the caissons and then the piers and then the pier cap, which is going to support girders. So uh, later this year, you should, uh, I don't have the exact date yet, but at some point there'll be an overnight closure or weekend closure of the airport parkway to place the girders that go between the two pier caps across that location. So they'll close the road while they do that work. So go to the next one. This is with the pier cap after it's stripped off. So this is kind of the finished product. Um, one, one out of the three. If you go to the next one, you see the, uh, you see the other columns and future pier cap location kind of coming out of the ground. So you see you know, the, the airport is in the distance and then the foreground shows the, the existing caissons and piers that are in progress and then behind us would be where the additional uh, piers and pier cap would be installed for that kind of secondary, that roadway that will be built in the future. Uh, the other one, if you drive past the airport, if you take uplands to get to the airport, um, there's a, it doesn't need to be as wide at that location. It's down to a single track, um, but there's a pier cap formed at one location uh, and poured and set and ready to go. The other location, so we can go to the next slide and show you the, the picture of that. Um, so there's the, the pier cap construction underway. Um, on the other side of the road, so this is the one you can see now. On the other side of the road, we're very close to uh, an electric utility, and so we actually have to uh, drop that electric utility down to the ground, go through a conduit kind of through the area, then back up again. So we're waiting on some utility work before we finish that second pier cup at Uplands Road. Uh, Bowesville Road, similar type of work. Um, I don't have the, the photos at the location, but uh, because it's essentially just a bunch of rebar poking out of the ground at this point. Uh, but, you know, making good progress there. Earl Armstrong, uh, same thing, uh, mobilization of the caisson subcontractors, a number of the caissons and the piers are underway. Um, this is actually also in, in the design we've uh, provisioned for the future widening of Earl Armstrong Road. There's also some work to take out the funny jog in the curve at that location um, so that Earl Armstrong goes straight through. So just a photo of the, the activity that you'll see at the location if you drive past. Um, so they've mobilized on the ground. You see on the right-hand side a series of the... Uh, the, the, essentially the, the column pieces that are used to, for the caisson um, and then the drill rig there to, to actually get it into the ground. Lime Bank is the next one. So Lime Bank is, uh, as you know, as we reported at the last uh, Fed codes, uh, or maybe a couple ago now, um, going to an elevated station. So we're going to uh, a change from what was shown at the bid phase where it was at grade. This one's elevated, so we have to do multiple structures to get to an elevated uh, line bank station um, up over the road and then up to an elevated station at that location. Um, 
just some older photos of, of Lime Bank Station. Obviously, this is, uh, <clears throat> this is back from the fall, just to give a sense of how much work was done at the time. So the foundations, the granular base has been installed at those locations, uh, making good progress in terms of getting ready as soon as, uh, soon as winter leaves us, we'll be back in there with force. Uh, so a couple more photos of uh, just some of the guideway work that's happening in those locations. So the, the at-grade guideway work is fairly straightforward. It can progress quite rapidly. Um, once the foundation is set, you're just building up ballast and you're into installing rail right away. So that can go quite quickly. Um, some upcoming activities for, for later this year. So start of a rail bridge over Hunt Club Road. So Hunt Club right now, there's a single... Uh, rail bridge over the road. Uh, we're actually double tracking at that location, so there'll be kind of a, it'll be a passing point uh, for trains. And there's also, as part of the uh, the install the construction of a of a second rail bridge at that location, there'll be a pedestrian bridge as well um, to get people across Hunt Club Road at that location. Um, reference here to the MUP underpasses at Carlton. Um, we'll be working on the new uh, new stations along the extension. Uh, guideway construction will continue, and then you know the big the big one here is really the shutdown on May 3rd, 2020, to facilitate the the work on the existing line. So on the next uh, slide, I'll talk a little bit about the the work. Um, so extending all of the station, existing stations, adding two new stations, a station at Walkley, a station at Gladstone. Uh, obviously, the, the MTO is going to be doing their bridge replacement project. If you, if you drive by at that location right now, you'll see the preliminary formworks in place for them to be able to push that, uh, uh, that new, new bridge into place. The existing bridge is going to be uh, demolished basically in the vertical direction, so it'll be dropped down, and then they'll push the new structure in over top over a weekend closure. I don't have the date for that closure, but as soon as you'll be the first to know as soon as I know. Um, that would be a, kind of a big event, I think, to, to replace that bridge. Um, and obviously the, the replacement bus service coming in, uh, and we'll provide a, few, a bit more detail on the routing and, and the updates and the quantity of buses at the uh, March 18th Transit Commission. So O-Train East, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of activity going on in the, uh, in the eastern section. Um, so just to kind of give you a highlight of... Uh, you know, the crux of the, the work in the east is related to Greens Creek and some culverts over a, a major creek in that area. Uh, Montreal Flyover Bridge, so this is actually a, a new rail bridge that's going to take the train from the middle of the road uh, to the side of, one side of the highway to be able to kind of get it into Blair Station. Um, and then the actual Montreal, Montreal structure itself for the Montreal Road Overpass, but also Montreal Station. So a big, a, a big project there. Uh, and we've got some good photos that we'll show you in a second. Um, some final designs for what I would say is, uh, you know, some of the, some of the minor stuff, the multi-use pathway landscaping, utility expansions, variable message sign relocation, but also a couple of stations. And so we're still, uh, as part of those stations, still working through the roadway package to make sure that we get the connectivity right at those locations. Um, and I, pretty, pretty well advanced in terms of final design, but obviously still some opportunity to influence the, uh, the minutia of those stations and, and the connectivity. Um, Pre-final designs, traction power substations, comm systems, traction power system wide, track and uh, guideway overall design. Um, so, you know, the, the Confederation East has a bit of a kind of a longer lifespan, so we see stuff coming in a little bit more quickly on the Trillium line. These ones have a little bit more time to develop. Uh, and then the, the construction schedule here, um, again, similar to, uh, similar to the Trillium line, essentially the entire line is going to be under construction by the end of this year. We should see uh, stations start to pop up by the end of the year. Um, you should see uh, major works happening at Montreal Road over the summer. Um, so there's going to be a, lo a lot of activity. The activity right now is focused on Montreal Road as well as Greens Creek, but very quickly behind that, as soon as they get uh, some work done there, they'll be able to move very quickly. Um, so just in terms of some of the construction, uh, tree and vegetation clearing is approximately 98% complete. Obviously, we've got an April 1st deadline. Uh, after April 1st, because of the bird migration season, we need to stop uh, vegetation removal. So we'll certainly respect that deadline. Uh, and then an, a bunch of work at Montreal Road with the interchange. So we're putting in supports to support the existing structures that are there while we build out the new structures. Some water main relocations and then an access road to be able to get into Greens Creek to do the work we need to do there. So if you... If you bear with me, and this is actually, uh, uh, a lot, we've gotten a lot of questions about how, how do we run the, the LRT down the middle of the, uh, the 174. And so this, uh, this 
video is a very good visual of, uh, of essentially the work that we're, some work that's ongoing, but also it ends with a little piece on uh, how we're adjusting the road and how we're getting the, the station in between the two lanes of the road network. If you have got the glasses, this works in 3D as well. It, there, there is a soundtrack. It, uh, I can hum along, but it's not working today, so I'll save you that. This is the best part. So obviously that video will be made available on the website if you want to replay that the last 15 seconds there to get a sense of how to, how to put a, a train line down the middle of the road. But if we go to the next slide, I can just kind of talk a little bit about what's happening there. Um, so you see there's essentially a vertical post with some, right in the very center, um, there's supportive excavation that we've kind of pounded into the ground at that location to allow, to basically hold up the existing structure. Um, we're going to build a structure, new structures on either side of the existing structures um, to make space for in the middle of the, the 174 to allow the, uh, the station to come up in between the two, two sections of eastbound and westbound lanes of traffic. Um, you see on the bottom right uh, one of the lane configurations that was already done kind of last year in terms of moving a lane out of the way. Um, there'll be you, know, you kind of see an abandoned uh, set of lanes there on the right-hand side as well. So there'll be a series of reconfigurations through this area. Um, I think the next, uh, next couple of slides kind of give you a sense of, uh, you know, the type of work that's going on at that location, um, just in terms of... It, it, actually, if you go back one, Matt, I'll, I'll, one more thing I'll just say about Montreal Road. In the middle of Montreal Road, we actually have to install uh, six piers to support the existing or the new structures and the new roadway structures. In order to get into the roadway, um, we're going to start seeing lane closures on Montreal Road in this section um, starting in April. Uh, part of that, you know, the, the contractor, we've given them authority under the contract to start June to essentially Labor Day is in the contract. They've come back to us and asked if they can start, have an early start in April with those lane closures still being finished by Labor Day, but then it being a one-time deal where they don't have to come back to this location or do any additional uh, lane closures on Montreal Road in the future. And so, um, you know, we thought that was a, a pretty good offset in terms of doing it in one summer, uh, rather than having to, to split that work over multiple summers. And so, that's the uh, that's the current plan for this area. So, if you go to the next, uh, uh, you just see some of the, the pile installation. So, the putting up the shoring to keep to protect the existing structure. Uh, closer look of that's kind of the before. If the next photo shows the after, uh, so this is kind of the the piles going into the ground. Um, and then you see the filling it with the, uh, the wood structure to kind of hold back the existing uh, ground, uh, allowing them to backfill and work on either side, or work on the one side. Uh, and then the next slide, just kind of the, a lot of excavation in this area to make space for, for that station that's in the, the middle of the road. Um, so just a, a little bit of the look ahead. Uh, so we're going to, the, the Highway 174 widening is continuing, the flyover preparatory work. Uh, they're doing some work uh, at Jean d'Arc. The intersection reconfiguration is scheduled to happen later this summer, uh, which is good news. Uh, there'll be some work on trim interchange, uh, the reconfiguration there to make way for the station and the, the final road, uh, roadway configuration. Um, there, so this is the, the new Jean d'Arc uh, configuration, if you can kind of get a sense for essentially there's a couple of uh, you know, slip ramps that are being eliminated. We're going to a full intersection at those locations. Um, so really just trying to urbanize the location a little bit, slow down traffic and make it safer for in the eventuality where we have a, a station in the middle of that, uh, that road um, over the highway, improve the connections uh, from the community to and from that station. 
And then the next one, I spoke a little bit about the Montreal Road uh, lane closure, so mid-April to actually end of, uh, end of August, Labor Day is kind of their deadline to get off of there. Um, in addition, there'll be some temporary off-peak lane closures. Uh, previously, I had spoken to this group about uh, uh, widening of the entire uh, 174 to make space in the middle. Uh, the contractor is now looking at between Montreal Road and Blair Station, uh, moving all the traffic to one side of the road, uh, maintaining the transitway on kind of the northern side and all five lanes of traffic. Uh, regular traffic will be on the southern side. There's still uh, they're still reviewing that, analyzing it. It gives them some opportunity to uh, protect the transit way for a longer period of time if they do that, um, with essentially having the same uh, road impacts on, on the lane configuration. But more to come on that and more, more briefings uh, with the councillors before we make that final decision. Uh, so looking at the West, you know, just in terms of the, the progress, the things that, that are going ongoing in the West, the construction drawings in progress with the, the track design, uh, light maintenance and storage facility, a uh, lot of interface with the MTO in this for that maintenance and storage facility, a uh, lot of interface with the NCC, obviously doing a lot of work uh, in their area. Uh, we still have another uh, parkway detour to be completed to move the, the SJM out of the way to create space for uh, the future tunnel construction. So that's supposed to happen this summer. Uh, and then obviously throughout that area, there's a series of, here they're called overpasses. It's a road overpass and pedestrian underpass to get to, to get to the shoreline. So there'll be a series of activities on those structures as part of the, ro the road movements to make sure that the access is maintained. In terms of final designs, uh, still, so I spoke about a couple of those pedestrian overpasses, or, uh, underpasses there. Um, Goldenrod Bridge, some work, uh, Lincoln Fields, elevated rail flyover structure, and Pinecrest Pond, uh, the, this is the Woodruff Stormwater Pond. The, the design has been advanced uh, for a long time now. We, we essentially gave the, the design builder a 90% design for that work, and so they've, they've advanced it uh, further just to kind of make it, make it 100%. Some preliminary designs that are underway. Uh, so a series of stations uh, that we're working on, uh, s additional work on the storage facility at the light maintenance facility, just trying to make sure that we have the appropriate storage for the trains, um, some ramp work, and then obviously all the stations. Uh, recently, we were able to confirm that uh, Corkstown Road can be configured as a two-way road at one point during the design uh, due to the lack of space. Moody was going to essentially cause a one-way road through that area. We can, uh, we are now looking at a two-way road along Corkstown past Moody Station, which is, um, I think, in the interest of the community. I think they, they pushed for that very hard, so we're glad to be able to do that. In terms of the construction schedule on the next slide, um, so this is uh, still the status quo, except uh, obviously by the end of 2020, we expect the entire, uh, the entire west to be under construction, save and except for the last bit of the, the existing transit way between Tunney's and Dominion. Uh, so there's still some additional work to be done there. Uh, infrastructure Services is doing some sewer renewal work in that area. We need to install a, uh, a temporary bridge across the, tra the transit way before we take traffic off the transit way onto Scott Street. Uh, so still a lot of planning to be done there to get that work underway. Um, some vegetation cleanup uh, activities, so still underway with, uh, with tree removals and other things. Again, our April 1st being our deadline for when we need to stop before we can kind of restart at the end of September. Uh, I don't think there's much to say there uh, beyond us just removing trees in, in all places possible at this time to support construction. Just a kind of a look at Lincoln Fields, uh, some of the, the preparatory work and the, the space that we need to, to build out the network at that location. Uh, Iris Station, just kind of a quick uh, overview of, of the location of that, of Iris, future Iris Station. So this, this location, you know, we removed a lot of trees in this location, but, uh, and, and we're starting construction as early as possible this location, in part because there's so much work to be done on, on the creek through this area, uh, moving the location of the creek, uh, essentially, you know, th through the area, the blank space, putting in a new station, having to build a new road overpass. There's a series of things here that we're doing to essentially re-naturalize the area, uh, improve the quality of the street, the quality of the stream bed and the st the, the creek itself. Um, and, uh, and so we're getting an early start to the extent that we can. And then just kind of looking back towards, uh, towards where the, the station will be located. 
<clears throat> Pinecrest Creek Pond. Uh, so we've done some work on a multi-use pathway in that area. Uh, they are preserving some of the root wads. You may see those from the existing trees. Um, you, you may see those starting to pile up in different locations. They're actually collecting these uh, root wads because they're going to be used in the construction of the pond. Apparently, I, this is, I didn't, wasn't aware of this. You, you turn them over, install them in the pond, and they prevent, not provide, they prevent loafing and nesting opportunities for geese. So discouraging uh, geese nesting in that pond, uh, likely connected to the, uh, the, the, you know, the pathways for the, for the nearby airport. Just a quick overview of what the, the Pinecrest Creek Pond design looks like. Um, so still maintaining all the, uh, the multi-use pathways through, through this area. Um, obviously the big uh, encatchment area at the bottom uh, that you see there. A lot of work, uh, a lot of investment in terms of number of trees and, and vegetation that's going back into this area once it's in its final state. So some upcoming uh, activities that you'll, that you'll see in the community. So Byron Linear Park, so the big uh, crux of a challenge there is kind of moving some hydro lines out of the way. Um, hydro One has a restriction on when we can move. Essentially Hydro One is causing a constraint on Hydro Ottawa as to when we can actually move those utilities. Um, but the idea is to, to move them as soon as we can, which should be July, August, get them out of the way, allow them, uh, the contractor to start building the cut and cover tunnel through Byron Linear Park. Um, a series of other areas kind of underway. Pinecrest, the stormwater pond itself, is still waiting on the final ECA permit. Once we have that, they'll, they'll start in earnest on that location. Um, and a lot of work over by baseline as well. We can get access into that location quite easily. The underground station already exists, and so once the designs are done, we should be able to work in there pretty much unfettered. Um, some additional activities later this summer. Uh, so I mentioned the, the SGM uh, relocation to make way for the tunnel. Uh, so then that cut and cover tunnel uh, construction will start. Uh, we do expect to see the Moody light rail uh, facility start up as well. We're hoping to have that completed by 2021, 2022. So that'll be one of the first uh, structures that's up and running uh, early on in the project. Um, so just a reminder of the SJAM, some of the current configuration, uh, the top line there. Uh, so you see the, the yellow line, which is kind of conflicting with the, uh, the planned future rail line. Uh, so we need to move that out of the way, um, build the straight line, and then uh, we get into that temporary condition where the SJAM is out of the way and allows us to kind of build, uh, build the tunnel, uh, and then the, the parkway will be moved back over the tunnel in certain areas once we come back and put it in its final configuration. Just from a high level, these are the locations of the tunnels. So Parkway Tunnel through the design period has expanded a little bit. It's, a little, it's closer to three kilometers now. Um, and then we've got a Connaught Tunnel, which uh, in the bottom left of the, the diagram there, a short 600 meter tunnel roughly, um, just to kind of get, get through the park area and then over to, uh, to the space adjacent to the highway through that location. We thought we'd just uh, provide, it's a little bit tough to, uh, to see from a distance, but uh, essentially this is a sequence of uh, diagrams that show the methodology to do the cut and cover tunnel. Um, so starting from the top left, you know, you have the traffic in the way, and so the step two is to, to move the traffic out of the way, which is kind of the step we're in now, um, moving the SJAM out of the way. Um, the third, the top right you know, box, is essentially you put in the support of excavation, so you're drilling down. Depending, depending on the, the ground conditions, there's a few different techniques that you do to put that support uh, in place. And then the second row, um, you essentially excavate the space between the support of excavation before you fill in the box, which becomes your tunnel, and then you fill it over uh, you know, with dirt and soil. In our case, we're putting two to three meters of cover on to be able to support future vegetation. Or in some instances, you see the bottom, the last box, number seven, uh, you put the road, uh, road traffic back over the, the tunnel. So that, that will be the case in some locations, but not all, all locations. But this essentially gives you the sequence for, for building out that tunnel. Um, there'll be a variety of different techniques to use to excavate the material. There'll be some blasting, there'll be some uh, kind of hammering or rock header style uh, movement of rock through that area, but there'll be a, a lot of work uh, to, to remove all that material. So if you get go to the next slide, you see a kind of a sense of uh, 
when when they're planning to work through this area so they're not uh, you know because it's cut and cover they can essentially work in all areas all the time they don't need to it's, there's nothing sequential necessarily about their construction activity um, so you see a couple areas where they're trying to get in there in the spring and then the summer after the detour is done uh, they want to go as quickly as they can into that uh, putting the supports in and then excavating the material Next slide, Kanat. So the Kanat Tunnel and then the, the station at, lo at that location, L a little bit later in the year, back into the fall, um, they've got some, you know, obviously a difficult, you know, very constrained areas to get in and out of that location. Uh, essentially between the highway and an industrial park, there is an OC transport facility at that location. Uh, it gives us some additional access and opportunity to get in, but otherwise uh, fairly constrained. And so they're still working through some of the methodologies on how they're going to build build the tunnel and essentially build a new cut area through that uh, that section of the track. Next uh, slide just shows Pinecrest Trench. Uh, so this is uh, going underneath the, the road work there, uh, building through a trench to provide the station at that location, uh, trying to get in there by this fall. And then the next, uh, you may have seen the uh, Stage 2 Alstom Citadus vehicles uh, that are undergoing testing. Um, so we are, uh, you know, there are a number of vehicles still uh, being assembled. The next 12 vehicles are being assembled in Ottawa. Uh, you, you've probably seen a few of these vehicles. We've uh, labeled them in this fashion to make sure that there's no confusion about getting on these trains accidentally because they do run during service hours, primarily in the late weekday evenings they've been, been been on the track. Um, we're essentially trying to prove them out and demonstrate that they can run in service reliably. Um, the next two are, are close to being ready. There's a couple of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's one snag that we're, we've asked RTG to work through before they hand those trains over. Otherwise, we are going through and making sure that uh, the vehicles are up to date with the latest modifications. So they do have the strap hangers. Uh, there are a couple of mitigations for the inductor failures. They've got the new lids on the, on the roof of those inductors. They've got uh, the insulators. Um, so we are kind of following up and making sure that any software modifications, hardware modifications that are being applied to the existing fleet are applied to the, uh, uh, to the new vehicles as they come off the line. Uh, so just overall, where are these 38 vehicles? Um, so 23 uh, still in production, or awaiting production, four in production, seven are undergoing testing, and so there's various stages of testing happening here and in Brampton, um, and four vehicles are in, a, in acceptance testing. So essentially they've, uh, we've received the safety certification from the signaling supplier, from the, the train manufacturer, and we're just putting them through their paces on the line, uh, out of service, to make sure that they're ready to go. Um, once we uh, do the final acceptance and confirm that we're satisfied with their operation, then they would be added to the existing fleet of 34 vehicles, and you, you, hopefully you'll go up to 36 shortly, and then 38 after that, so to help uh, essentially bolster the fleet that's available for peak service. Um, that's, that's the plan with those. Uh, so just a little bit to end on uh, a note regarding engagement. Um, so we've done a number of drop-in sessions across the city in different areas. There's been different requests coming in. So we've got a, a large team that's, that's working on those. They're obviously very happy to, uh, to, to participate and share the, share the message about the work that's upcoming. Um, you know, are doing one-off uh, sessions with councillors when there's specific questions and trying to uh, provide as much information about the design and the current progress of the, the project as we can as we move forward. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you. Just uh, a couple of points, Mr. Morgan. Um, I'm assuming that we're getting some of the steel from China. Is there any indication that there's a supply chain issue as a result of the uh, coronavirus coming out of China? At, at this time, I have no indication that there's a uh, supply chain issue affecting uh, assembly. Okay, and uh, the other issue, you, you went over it on one of the slides. The, the question I'm often asked when I'm on campus at Carleton is, why can't uh, you, know, you do um, the uh, Trillium line in sections and at least allow, you know, from Carleton to Bayview to continue and then, you know, keep it open a little longer. You know, I know you're doing the bridge over the, the Rideau River, but is, if you looked at every possible way to try to keep, because, you know, the students and the staff and employees are, you know, love the, uh, the O train and to, to replace it with bus service for a long period of time is, I think, they're going to find very frustrating. So have we looked at seeing if we can keep sections of it because you don't have the same catenary system as a diesel train. 
It's right. more self-contained. Yeah. I, you know, I think that uh, prior to the Trillium Line project uh, kind of being awarded, we spent a lot of time working with the MTO. The MTO was coming to us and asking for access to the line. Um, they're looking to be able to do their work in a manner that's as efficient as possible. Um, and so even prior to the us knowing about having the shutdown, there was a series of requests from them to shut the line down for a couple of summers. Uh, we came close to doing a shutdown for them last summer. Uh, or I don't recall if it was as long as they wanted, but uh, certainly you know, their scope of work and the activity that they need to do uh, in that area prohibits us from running from Carling to Bayview uh, for this. We've essentially given them that land to do the work in that area. Um, the other crux of the area is really the, uh, the grade separation at Via Diamond, um, which is a, a major bridge structure that needs to be built. And so um, very quickly, they need to get in there. They need to dismantle the existing diamond uh, and start building that structure over the Via. So that kind of, those two uh, constraints essentially prevent us from being able to, to do anything okay. sooner you. or faster. Uh, Councillor Elshantiri, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'd like to begin by thanking staff for being here all day and answering some questions. And I'd like to begin by uh, asking the city manager. So we have among us, we have the procurement process chief, I believe, and the fairness commissioner with us. Is that who we have with us? So my question to the Fairness Commission first, I'd like to ask, uh, we hear time and time again, council delegate authority to staff and staff. Uh, first of all, thank you. We ha I, had, I had a meeting with, with you folks, the staff and the legal. And, uh, but I, I want to understand a little bit more about the delegated authority. Was that, did staff stay with that scope of the delegated authority council give to, to staff uh. to, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I think I think this question is it would be more suited to the next agenda item when we're presenting the uh, procurement process. I think that question will arise as part of the presentation, the discussion. It doesn't really fit into this part, well, but that's of course up the, to the chair. I, I look at this number, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, and a lot of it is blacked out, and a lot of it is for for a good reason. I'm not, but I want to make I want to understand with the. Fairness Commission and the procurement uh, chief, up, were they involved with this process and were they at least satisfied with the process took place? Or, uh, I mean, I can wait till, to, to hear it after I know that the LRT is not coming to CARP anytime soon. I understand that, but I just want to make sure we are follow that process here and, and or the process was followed. Because I did, when I met with staff, I did ask them, I'm going to ask this question here. Yeah, I, th I think as uh, the city manager indicated, that's a very good question for, for the next item on uh, the agenda, uh, Councillor. Okay, I can wait. But I okay. appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Cavanaugh, please, on uh, item one. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Mike, for, uh, for all your work on all the projects that are, are going on. Um, it's a big, complicated project, and um, it's, it's about getting communications and information out. That's really important. Um, residents uh, see things happening, and, and uh, it's, um, it's, it's important that they have it in a timely fashion. Um, one of the issues we came across lately was uh, a tree that we thought was going to be safe for one more year. Um, uh, we got less than 24 hours notice that uh, it was going to be taken down. These are the kinds of things that uh, are, are a concern to residents because uh, we had promises. Um, is there something we can do to improve the speed of, of communications to give more notice for when there's changes coming? Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, that, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the incident with the, the tree that was removed was, was unfortunate, but it certainly two east west connectors flagged you know, a, a big concern because it was escalated to, to myself and to the city manager uh, pretty immediately. So I think that they're aware of that issue and they, they need to be more cognizant of uh, where they make uh, commitments regarding uh, when they're going to do work, when they're not going to do work. I think, uh, you know, that, that applies to both teams. I just had a, the, uh, the team on the Trillium line 
uh, give a commitment that they're going to wait on some tree removals uh, between Beach and Young for another four months. And so, uh, you know, they need to be held to account to those. And so we've certainly escalated that issue within East-West Connectors. They know they need to do a better job of, especially on the logistical side, when they're mobilizing into a site. Um, so, so I agree with you and happy to work with your office to make sure that gets done. Thank you. And one of the things we're going to be doing coming f going forward is having working groups. Um, I found that worked really well with um, the Cleary Station that uh, Jeff had got started earlier. And um, I think that would be a good uh, way to deal with it, not just having boards up, but having in-depth meetings where you have representatives of the community working together uh, to get uh, deeper answers because uh, there's just so much information. Right. Excuse me, um, Councillor Harder, I'm speaking, and I'm having a hard time hearing myself. Thank you. Um, one of the things was um, trees. Um, the, um, you know, it's always a shock when you see those big trees taken out, and um, uh, it's, um, you know, it gets a lot of emotions. Um, but I'd like you just to reiterate the policy, just to remind people that, uh, of the uh, replacement policy. So uh, there's, there's a few different policies. Generally, when we describe it, it's a two to one ratio on the policy, but there, are, there can be different, uh, different factors that influence the specific race, uh, replacement ratio, depending if it's a species at risk or a larger tree or on MTO versus NCC land. There are different, depending on the area, there, there can be a different requirement, but broadly speaking, we talk about a two to one ratio. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank you for the work on uh, Corkstown Road, um, making it uh, two-way. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it today um, because that certainly was a concern to the community. Um, it, it, uh, to have it one way was, was very problematic for a community that doesn't have shopping in it. Um, so that, that was a major route, so I appreciate it. Uh, but one of the parts of it is the fact that now that we are having definitely two-way traffic um, is to make sure that it doesn't speed because um, it is a cut-through road. It is a road that parallels the Queensway. And um, we want to make sure that people do not speed. And um, we put in a request, and I spoke to uh, Vivici about this, and she agreed with me about uh, possibly a raised intersection at uh, Crystal Beach Road to help uh, slow down the traffic. And I wonder if you can comment on that. I, th I mean, the overall roadway design, you know, we've uh, got the land acquisition now to be able to do the two-way. So I think as part of the roadway package, that's something we can look at. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate that, that cooperation. Um, in terms of um, uh, Lincoln Field Station, um, we really appreciate the opening up of the ponds, and um, I'm just wondering if we can see that the creek is totally daylighted. I know this is something the NCC was pushing for, and it is their property. Is it possible to get uh, the whole creek daylighted? I think there's probably a couple spots where it's not, but it's certainly we can kind of take that away and look at uh, yeah. uh, what what the impacts are and and the locations where it's not possible. Currently, we have the transitway going through there, and once the transitway is taken out, I, I think people appreciate that we're going to have a very large green space in that area, and um, it'll feel like a, a park setting, and uh, that'll be great. Um, the one question that comes up a lot is the fact that we're doing a whole study on Lincoln Fields and the secondary plan, um, but uh, the, the problem is, is that the connectivity between the station and this whole area, this whole development that is um, going to be redone, is very poor. It's uh, right now, um, you, you're supposed to go along Carling Avenue, and I can tell you it's very dangerous. Um, it's basically the, similar to an off-ramp off of a off of a highway when you cross over, and um, that's about it. And uh, the connectivity with what's something that is supposed to get very developed and have a lot of uh, uh, residential buildings in it um, in eventually. Right now we're at phase one. But um, are you willing to work with uh, Rio Can to help make it uh, better connectivity and others in the area, such as Osgood Properties and others? Yeah, absolutely. We've, uh, you know, I've made a commitment at this uh, session to go through all the areas and re review the connectivity. We uh, we started with the uh, some connectivity sessions in the east that we're working through now. The next uh, the next section that we're uh, focused on working with planning and transportation planning is 
uh, wanting to resolve Walkley Road, and then we, we would turn our attention to, uh, to the West connections uh, after that. Thank you, because I think it'd be a real missed opportunity not to have some sort of better connection. Um, I think it, it's very important, not just for Lincoln Field property, but uh, for those that uh, live west and north of, of the transit station. Um, currently, it's not even maintained. It's, it's very poorly maintained in the winter, so it's very difficult for people to get there. Um, another issue is, um, is in Connaught the, uh, at the Pinecrest station. Um, I don't know, are you calling it the Pinecrest? Or sorry, pardon me, the um, Queensview station. Uh, you call, uh, I just saw you said, talking about the Connaught tunnel, but um, the Queensview station. Um, right now, there's no uh, designated uh, access that, uh, uh, to get to the station, and it's certainly up in the air, and, and it's uh, a big mystery. Uh, when will we have answers on, on that? Uh, I'd have to check the specific date for Queensview Station for you, but I can get back to you and provide you that the, the connectivity and then the the MUP layout at that location and the roadway network at that location. Thank you, because that'll make a difference on other decisions. Because we've got decisions to make on putting in sidewalks, etc., um, in the neighborhood. So so that'll help. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, next, with the questions, comments, Councillor Menard, please. Thanks, Mayor. Mine will be uh, fairly short. I do want to pick up on what you had mentioned about the, the O train, because I hear it too. Every time I'm at Carleton, there's, uh, there's concern with um, uh, some of the administration, but also people aren't as aware as they should be. So we're, we're putting it in our newsletter. Uh, we haven't had a session yet at Carleton. I've been asking to get a date. So is there a date now booked for at Carleton before the students get into exam time uh, and they're very busy? I'd like to have that happen you know, before we hit... Uh, kind of mid, mid to late April. It'd be ideal to have it before mid-April. So is there a date that, that you set for? You know, I don't have a date for the comm session. I know that our comms team has been working with Carleton University to kind of help inform their, uh, you know, in their students and help inform, uh, you know, people who are planning where they're going to live, you know, next year. You know, that's kind of a, equally as an important decision, but happy to work with you to, to ensure that we're aligned on the communications with Carleton University and make sure that we're getting out and doing a session if you want one at that location. Yeah, no, I've been speaking with Andy Goodchild. We're just kind of getting to a point where we need to get a date soon because uh, people are going to be in exams. And, and the, other, the other piece is um, just the communication in general. So I saw this is an item coming, I guess, in, in mid-March uh, on the R2 service yeah. uh, that will be happening. But people aren't aware of how long we're shutting the O-Train down. And, yeah, the, the R2 service is a big one. So the more the city can do to, to publish this, to get this information out, the better. Uh, it's mostly students that use that line, not, not exclusively, but a lot. the biggest user of that line is, is students. Um, and many of them just, just are not aware. Um, so it, the more we can do, do you have some ideas on what we can do to communicate this uh, in the next little while? Uh, I assume that March 19th session is a big way. Any other ways that we can communicate this? Yeah, I mean, happy to have a discussion with Annie and others in the comms team to explore all the options for getting that, that message out to the students. Okay, um, and is the project currently on time? Broadly, it's on time, yes. Broadly, yeah. okay, so we're not expecting a, a longer it, Shut down. Right? I mean, it's uh, it's too early to tell if it's uh, if it's late or not. You know, I think that there's some indicators for me. Uh, you know, the first Stadler vehicle is supposed to show up in the fall of 2021, uh, so I'm going to be watching for that truck uh, delivery. Uh, if uh, if we don't see those first vehicles showing up, then that'll be an early indicator to me that we have an issue. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. All right. Thank you, uh, Councillor Eglai, Please. <coughs> uh, thank, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up uh, question, Mr. Morgan, uh, on the trains that you're testing. Uh, so obviously, we the trains are, in theory, the same trains we have now, which we're not satisfied with, which we've asked for fixes on. Um, so how does that work? Um, when when uh, what's the drop dead date? I guess is the way to put it for the new trains to have all the modifications that we would like to see in there. So it's not the same as the original product we've got, but it's, it's better, performs more efficiently, more reliably uh, in winter, that sort of thing. So when, when the trains that are being tested now, when do they become ours? And what's the drop dead date to have modifications of basically from lessons learned from uh, the first version of the train? So to the extent that there are modifications available today, uh, we're applying those modifications to those vehicles. 
um, as new modifications uh, come online, we'll, we would progressively apply those modifications. So just by way of example, uh, so the inductors uh, have been failing, they've been shorting out due to the buildup of dirt, salt, water, grime, so we short out the inductors on, on the, the roof of the vehicles. And so there's a couple of mitigations for that. One is they, they've built a, a new, it sounds simple, but it's, uh, it's not. It's actually quite a complicated solution. The, they're air-cooled units, and so there's a new cover or lid for that unit that's installed on the trains as well as a, an insulator. So Now, that's not the final uh, mitigation for that issue, but, or final solution, but it is the current mitigation. And so we would expect that any current mitigations or current software modifications, hardware modifications that are available today would be on that vehicle, understanding that uh, you know, we expect a new software release on the door system to come out later this year. As that becomes available, we would put it on that vehicle. Um, so, which is to say that not all the modifications, not all the mitigations to, to improve the vehicle are ready today, but the ones that are, we would ensure those ones are on the vehicles prior to accepting them. Now, am I correct in that any modifications we make to the original train uh, are included in the price? So, if they have to put the inductor shields on or whatever, we're not paying any more for that train than what we bargained for. Is that accurate? That, that's accurate. Uh, the, the exception being we did pay extra for the strap hangers. Right. Um, but That's it, still a bit of a mystery, but yeah. yeah. Um, but otherwise, the technical modifications, the door software, the inductor changes, the, you know, we're expecting later this year some brake modifications to come out. All of those things are included in, in the price that we're paying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Eglai. Councillor Tierney, please. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I want to thank your group, uh, uh, us in the Eastern Block. We're, we're short one right now, but uh, we'll get one back eventually, we're assuming. Um, on that, uh, you've been very great with us. We've met with you a couple of times about a couple of different things. Uh, I think uh, I've been uh, at a couple of meetings. One was with a, a cycling group, actually, uh, in the East End, and uh, we attended a meeting in our area, and they were concerned about the connectivity. Now, we've had previews of some of the samples that you guys have put together um, uh, that I think they would really enjoy seeing. Uh, we have taken a lot into consideration uh, with pedestrian and cycling connectivity, especially to Montreal Road Station. I know Laura and I are very passionate about that one. At what point are we going to be able to, I already know the answer, but if you can say it in public record, when are we going to be able to go to the community and share these great visions and get feedback? I think that, uh, you know, we've been tasked with a deadline of the first week of April. There's a pub uh, public consultation that we've been asked to uh, get the designs advanced to a point that we can share them and put in a format that's, uh, you know, visually understandable. And so that's what we're working towards. That's great. And uh, again, uh, just for the record, the 3D illustrations that people have seen, are, they were just illustrations and the newly updated illustrations and connectivity and mapping yeah. uh, will be far different and take in consideration many of the uh, cycling and pedestrian uh, best practices. Yes, absolutely. It, so to the extent that we make changes, update the connectivity or update the road configuration at a particular location, we would uh, accordingly update the renderings. Great, and we have, um, I see these, uh, these projects, there's actually three separate projects going on in stage two at the same time, and I forget who was uh, talking about uh, if it's on time. Uh, are we going to have some kind of uh, constant barometer or a thermometer of some sort for all three projects to show the progress on all the projects? So let's face it, there will always be a little bump in the road on some of them, but yeah. knowing, uh, you know, you can't treat them as one because there's three separate projects on the go. Yeah. Is that something that we'll be able to keep our... Finger yeah, on the pulse on? yeah, absolutely. There's different kind of in early indicators for each of the projects. They each have kind of different challenges. Um, you know, for Confederation East, you know, we want to make sure the additional stage two vehicles are ready to go, uh, and uh, you know, and and that we get through Montreal Road. Really, those kind of early indicators, want, wanting to see more stage two vehicles and getting Montreal Road Station uh, well under construction. Kind of the first two, and then there'll be subsequent ones to that. Great. And maybe, uh, is Steve Willis around, Steve? If I can bug you for one quick second. Um, um, I did want to uh, kind of highlight something. Uh, uh, Councillor Luloff and I were at a recent conference of uh, landlords, and we were chatting with people. And uh, 
I, I got to brag about the fact that the decision that this council made way back in the day, I, I remember very clearly Peter Hume bringing up uh, transit-oriented development and what kind of intensification would be around those transit nodes. And uh, I brought up facts that uh, condos, small, very small condos in my area have jumped from 200,000 to 300,000 in the period of two years. We're seeing uh, four uh, actually, five 22-story towers at Blair Station, a 30-story tower at Blair Station, four Searville uh, apartments coming in, plus a hotel. Uh, what are we seeing on the rest of the spine uh, in regards to transit-oriented development? So, Deputy Mayor, uh, what we saw, the, le the lesson we saw in the stage one, uh, as the construction continued and actually got closer to completion, we saw a very significant uptick in interest in transit-oriented development. So I asked my staff recently for, uh, it, was, it was a presentation we were doing to put, give me a quick list of what's in the TOD areas. And I can say that at Tunney's Lion, Parliament, Rideau, Pimacy, Bayview, uh, Lee's, Saint Laurent, Serville, and Blair Station, we have either approved redevelopment, uh, uh, active development applications, or very seriously advanced uh, applications being moved on. And we're now just at the cusp of stage two, starting to see some development interest activity, and we have approved applications at Cleary, Westboro Station. We have a very significant file coming forward at Gladstone Station, the planning committee in the next couple of months, and we are also getting pre-development inquiries in the Highway 174 corridor. Great, and uh, just to, to wrap up on that, I think, I know Councillor Dudas and, and myself as well have a lot of concern around Montreal Road Station and some future opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, Councillor Luloff way out in the, the further east, the far east, I'll call you, uh, with uh, tons of development going on out there. So I, I know it's successful in the east. I just want to see what was happening in the rest of the system. So thank you for that. Thank you to ma Madam uh, Chair. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lieber. Steve. Thanks, uh, Chair. The, uh, I've got to, two things that I'm, I'm interested in. The first is, I think one of my biggest concerns around the Stage 2 project is the Ottawa Hospital, the new campus, and a connection with, um, with our O-Train, with the Stage 2 line. How is that planning going? It's, it's going to be critical with the, the many thousands of staff who are going to be working there that it's connected. How far along that path are we? Councillor, we've been meeting with the Ottawa Hospital Plan uh, Planning Group for the last, I think we met with them last summer. Okay. And uh, they've showed us their high level concept and we're doing exactly what you're talking about is how we're gonna push people to the Carling Station. We've given them suggestions on uh, whether or not they're open to looking at uh, connections on all modes to the bus and the rail station okay. that's accessible to them. It's. I think a lot of us consider, at least the, the lay folks, our community uh, members, we consider it's critical to have something that is basically weatherproof, a weatherproof connection from the train into their workplace. Bingo. We, uh, we went right there very quickly. We had a high-level planning session. We kind of laid out some parameters, make the connection really... Um, uh, convenient, uh, weatherproof, and so forth. So we don't have any details on that, but we're totally aligned with what you're talking about. What are the odds that it's going to happen? It's too early in the process. Deputy Mayor, the, the Ottawa Hospital is still going through its various its second stage of approvals with the province. They will outline the programming needs. They're at a very different level of detail than, say, a development application. They're more at oh. how many square foot are needed for a cardiac unit, how many for, for this care and that. Uh, but they've certainly built into their program all of these elements, as we've asked and suggested. Ultimately, the province decides what the program they will they'll approve through the next stage, but the city has been consistent uh, in asking for those high-quality connections. Is there some future proofing that we need to do? in terms of how we build stage two out or it's mainly on their side uh, we pushed the envelope with them too and s said don't discount autonomous shuttles to get you to those spots from within the campus mm -hmm. that technology as you know with our test track and so forth is evolving very quickly they were intrigued by that concept so we've our teams are aligned in terms of staying 
very uh, open on how do you move people around that campus to those. Uh, they've got they've got great bus service and they've got great rail service. So let's leverage it. Was yeah. the message? No, it's it's going to be critical for that neighborhood. Um, as you know, we we continue to deal with increasing traffic levels, and uh, we are hoping staff will arrive um, uh, by train as much as possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second uh, thing I'm wondering about is. How are we doing with respect to um, deficiencies in the work thus far? Uh, have we had an opportunity to get reports back from, um, uh, from the contractor uh, where we've had to approve work? Do we have an idea of whether the work is proceeding well or not? You know, so we, uh, there is a quality assurance process. There is a non-conformance reporting process, and so we are... Uh, you know, we are starting to see the odd one come in. Um, we're tracking those. Uh, you know, we haven't, uh, I wouldn't say that, you know, we've, got, we've gotten to a place where there's kind of uh, any critical ones that have us concerned. You know, there was uh, some process ones. Uh, a key individual was swapped out, uh, didn't follow the process when they did that on one of the projects. Uh, another, another project, uh, you know, installed non-standard uh, traffic barriers, you know, so we're starting to see a few, you know, so, but it's still, I think that uh, in terms of the ramp up of construction over this summer, um, you know, you see the, the number of people going from, say, two to 500 people today building, doing works on the ground to the end of the summer where we expect to have over 1,500. Um, you know, that's where we need to start see, ensuring that the, uh, the, the process for capturing those is working correctly and that the, the work that's going into the ground uh, okay. is being measured correctly. So the, uh, any non-conformities you've seen have not been schedule threatening and, and are, everything is uh, running tickety-boo? Tickety-boo is a pretty... That's a technical term, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, not schedule threatening. Okay. Um, yeah, my, my encouragement is to uh, is to be as proactive as possible with um, with that kind of information. I think the uh, in stage one, you know, obviously there was a sinkhole that put everything back, but I think a number of us were surprised by how far behind schedule we were as a result of the deficiencies with right. the trains themselves. Um, so as we see these non-conformances, et cetera, uh, please be as, as uh, proactive as possible because uh, I know our friends up in the uh, gallery will be looking uh, closely at that as well. All right, thank you, Chair. Right, thank you, uh, Councillor Leeper. Councillor Luloff, please. I just want to thank you and your team for your advanced work on uh, Jean d'Arc that you uh, highlighted uh, here today. It's very important to my community and I really appreciate the work that you guys have put into it and uh, the fact that you front loaded that work. It's, uh, it's an incredible show of faith and we really appreciate it. Um, I've been asked uh, once again to extend the noise exemption for bylaw for the construction along the 174. Um, so I'd really like to ensure that we're front loading the noise barrier for this leg of the extension and hope that you can take that request uh, away. Um, we'd like to see what that design looks like and, and hopefully we can front load that. Uh, the people um, in uh, Orleans Wood uh, and Convent Glen and the villages uh, have been waiting for a very long time for a noise barrier. This is a wonderful opportunity uh, to get that work done for them. So I'm hoping that you might be able to take that away today. I appreciate that. Um, I also really appreciate uh, our recent conversations regarding connectivity with stations, including the widening of pedestrian walkways uh, close uh, to the stations uh, to 2.5 meters and beyond in some cases. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, when we might be able to see some, uh, some new drawings and new renderings uh, of these stations that we so, can share with the public. Yeah, so I think that uh, we're scheduled to meet on the 13th and uh, the team has been uh, requested to provide uh, information that can be made publicly available for the first week of April. Wonderful. Uh, KEV, uh, who is responsible for the eastern extension of the Confederation line and has nothing to do with any of the other proponents from stage two, uh, I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that, uh, have been excellent uh, in their communications so with my residents, though uh, when we send buck slips with uh, information some nearby residents have complained that they were not in receipt uh, of these notices. So I'd just like to request that uh, we either vary the contractor that we use or use Canada Post to ensure that we don't miss anyone, as particularly in Orleans Wood is where I've received some of those complaints. And in fact, uh, one of the complaints that I received is from one of the members in our audience today. So I think it's very, very important uh, that uh, people receive those buck slips um, as uh, we want to have as much participation as possible. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we can take away. Some the the 
the extent of the distribution sometimes is very narrow and doesn't always account for people that are otherwise impacted by the construction work, even if they're not living right adjacent to it? Or? Well, this is quite close. Okay. Well, so I apologize, <laughs> very, very I apologize if, we, if we missed one that was right on the alignment, but uh, we, we can certainly revisit the list. And if, the, if you can flag that a missing address, I'm happy to make sure it's added to the list. Certainly, with uh, her permission, I will do that. Um, I've had some trouble uh, with this issue office so when it comes to organizing information sessions. It took uh, a considerable amount of work to get our fall session organized uh, and we weren't able to announce it very quickly uh, because of how long it took uh, to organize, not giving a lot of leeway for us to make that announcement. I haven't been terribly impressed with the speed at which our spring session is being organized. Can I tell my residents today that on April 6th we'll have a, an information session in Orleans? Yes? Wonderful. Um, with uh, regard to Jean d'Arc Station, um, I'd like to pass on some, some feedback that I received recently at one of uh, our um, uh, economic development sessions that we had. Um, some residents are saying that uh, kiss and rides should be a priority at our stations in the east, so I just wanted to let you know of that. Um, and just some clarification on one point. Um, a lot of uh, residents are, are talking about the original plan for stage two moving to the east. Um, I'd just like some clarification on the point. Why was the permanent widening or the addition of a lane on the 174 dropped from the stage two project? I wasn't aware that it was in. Uh, so I, that's kind of I, background I, that I would have to go and find. I, cer I certainly did receive an answer in a closed session with with uh, some of the people sitting at this table. I'm wondering if we might be able to pass that information along publicly. If we, if we don't have it, we can get it for uh, Councillor. Uh, that, that'd be the best thing. We'll follow up with the Councillor in terms of that. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's all my questions. Thanks, Councillor Luloff. Uh, and our final speaker that I have on the list is Councillor Meehan, please. That would be me. Uh, just two seconds. I just need to... Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for all of this. Um, my qu I got a couple of questions. Number one, uh, um, the Trillium Line is coming into Riverside South and by August of 2022, which is really quite exciting for, for the community. But there's also a little bit of angst given uh, the problems that we've had with Stage 1 and uh, we're contracted at with one of the same companies that we've um, had some problems with. And anecdotally, we've had some people point out some issues that we've already had. So I'm wondering, is, is there any possibility at all that we have more oversight uh, built into the contract as it goes out to Long Bank Station? Can, uh, I know that you said there's some, there have been a few non-conformance issues, uh, but there's a way to, to check. But I'm wondering, if you, how, how do, can you explain to me how we check the construction as it, go, as it goes each stage, Mr. Morgan? So... Absolutely. One of the uh, one of the changes that I uh, instituted with the team was to have a dedicated group of uh, field inspectors, a dedicated uh, construction manager team from the start. Uh, and so I've built an integrated team uh, using support from CTP, which is the engineering consortium uh, that we're relying on, as well as uh, so they're providing some leadership as well as a number of people in the field. Uh, and so we have people kind of stationed in the field on a permanent basis. We've also provisioned for in the stage two contracts to have site trailers provided by all the bid team, all the teams uh, for our city staff so that they can essentially be co-located uh, in the field. So they're in the field at all times, seeing what's going on, witnessing all of the concrete pours, witnessing all of the activity, the early construction that's taking place. So trying to essentially embed a construction team with the existing construction team right from the start has been kind of one of the things that we've, uh, one of the changes that we made, having them co-located in the field at the site trailers, another change. Um, but having, having boots on the ground right from the start is one of the keys. I think the potentially the difference with the Trillium line is that we're starting from a place where uh, city staff have an in-depth knowledge of how that system operates. Um, we've got people who know the existing Alstom vehicles inside and out. They know the, 
they know each of those individual switches on the existing line inside and out. They've been responsible for the, how they were configured and maintained and installed. And so we've got a level of deep knowledge on the maintenance of the existing system. We also have a pool of uh, 45 highly qualified operators who know how to operate the Alstom Lint vehicles. And so out of the gate, the second that we have track to run trains on, we'll, we already have qualified staff who can operate existing trains on on, on that track. And so it gives us kind of a leg up, uh, you know, between the, the construction staff being in the field to, from the beginning, our technical background on the Trillium line, and having operators who can get out there with trains as early as possible uh, means that we can do start testing as, as quickly as possible and get, get a head start on, on issues that uh, may have been delayed in stage one because we didn't get, uh, you know, you didn't get the vehicles weren't ready right away, the track wasn't ready right away. Now uh, we've got operators and trains standing by ready to, to run a new track. And I understand some of the tracks already gone down? So, uh, no, I don't, no, I don't think that there will be, a, I, I'm not aware that there's been welding of, of rail that was brought in and put into the yard. It may have been pulled into place, but I don't believe any new track has been installed. By having this embedded team uh, of, um, you said, uh, how did you call like them? Field, field inspectors. The, our field inspectors. Have, have, have you uh, seen the benefits of having that already? Yeah, a, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, we get, uh, you know, John occasionally, but uh, me on a more regular basis, we get real-time updates uh, on the construction work in the field. Uh, so, you know, you know, early this morning we got, got an update saying that they're ready to start uh, caisson drilling at Montreal Road. You know, stuff like that where it's just, it's coming in, we've got people out there taking photos and monitoring and being present, uh, it absolutely gives us better information. But I'm talking about the Trillium line going out to Riverside well, South. Y yeah. yeah, I mean, it's the same. Okay. You know, but yeah. The, the, I didn't get an update this morning on no. Trillium line, but uh, the same narrative or example applies there. So you're confident of the construction that's happened so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, what, does, uh, what stage are we at in the design of the stations? Uh, the, the stations are at a mix uh, of, I, I don't think they're at construction yet, but they're, they're a mix of preliminary and final design. And I don't want to have to go through any of the retrofits that we've had to have on, on the Kinfed line stage right. one so far. Are we allowed to take a look at those designs? Because I know we've had, the, some of them didn't have uh, elevators. There was just ramps and things like that. Can we get a look at those before they're actually constructed? Yeah, absolutely. When yeah. would that, when well, might that I, be? I can, uh, we can reach out to your office and have a session to, to go through those. Uh, some of the stuff, like some of the, the conceptual stuff, the changes that have been made, for example, the addition of stairs and elevators, uh, that's available now. That's in updated renderings and updated concept drawings. Um, you know, some of the, the advanced details like the, uh, the electronics that's going on the platforms or the layout of the cameras, mm -hmm. we're just starting to see that now, but uh, there's certainly uh, very advanced design or very, very advanced information, I would say, to inform any reviews of, of the station designs. The stations are being designed by the same architects for stage one? That's yes. my understanding, yeah. okay. So there's, so is there uniformity or conform, like they're going to conform across the system, the type of look? Uh, I th so some yes and some no. So I think if you look at uh, uh, like a Walkley station, uh, Walkley station will have, uh, due to its kind of the change in elevation at that location, you will see uh, a use of a kind of a more modest, but a use of the same roof line that you saw in stage one and on the structure that's used to announce the presence of the station at that location. Uh, I think line bank will be uh, similar in, uh, you know, some of its distinctive features. Uh, you'll see a little bit of the same roof lines on uh, like the elevator banks and uh, some of the, the covered walkways. Uh, on the uh, Bozeville and Leitrim station, um, but you won't, you know, so you won't get a, a her, the equivalent of a Herdman station uh, on the Trillium line today. Something like Mooney's Bay will still be uh, a modest platform station with uh, with shelters. Do you know we did we did we address the covering of some of the stations? All uh, we expressed concerns about that. Uh, we you know we flagged uh, so Lime Bank being a key station because it's in the the middle of the community development uh, at that location. Um, we've been working to uh, ensure there's improvements at Lime Bank um, as part as part of our discussions with service planning. We've also been talking about uh, replicating any of the. Uh, the covered walkways that uh, that we've seen, you know, we've only seen the temporary uh, covered walkways go in at uh, Herdman and, and Tunney's and the, uh, there's some conceptual ideas that are out there for Blair, uh, but replicating some of that same type of weather protection um, 
basically from the train to the bus at the at key locations. Okay. And so we're still working through that. I, I'd love to take a look at them at some point. Okay, before. Thank you. And they, um, there's still people who are expressing really like shock and, and concern that we don't have a park and ride at Lime Bank Station, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's the terminus of where the train is going to come in to this new uh, Riverside South uh, Community Centre. And um, so I'm telling people, well, there is a park and ride at Riverview, which is fairly close, and Bowesville. Um, but we're trying to find out the, what's the link between the Riverview Park and Ride and Lime Bank is it, is it simply the BRT going in past there that goes to Lime Bank Station? Or uh, is, there, is there going to be a con, uh, some sort of shuttle or connector between the park and ride and the station? So I think with the, you know, as part of the project with the Leitrim park and ride, with the Bo's, new Bowesville park and ride, and then kind of the, the adjacent connectivity to, to any others or across the, across the river, you know, we, you know, there's a discussion to be had on the bus network in general and how it will be revised to reflect the connectivity to Lime Bank Station. And so to have that conversation, I need to bring uh, service planning into the mix. But right now it's just park and park and at Rideau View, River View, and take a bus to Lime Bank. I guess that's yeah. that's. So you'll have to okay. You have to transfer before you get to the main terminal. Okay, uh, one last question. I think we will have to talk about that one a little bit further, though. Um, just as some someone who has been driving in on Nicholas a lot, are we going to be taking those plywood boards down? Uh, between the uh, Queensway and the off-ramp and the station because a lot of people come in that way. It's just a, it's a lovely, lovely thing to look at. <laughs> I know it's protecting the tracks, but is that coming down anytime soon? Uh, I don't have a timeline for when those come down, but I assume that's part of the, uh, the general winter. We, we deactivate from winter, they come down. It's protecting the train from uh, snow, being, snow and ice being thrown on, on the roofs of the trains and onto the tracks. I would have to get back to you on the, the date for when those come down. So we've got a lot of tracks by roadways. Is this, uh, we're going to have to protect the rails in many different locations as we, you know, continue on this journey with two light rail? Yes. The, the same way that uh, on road overpasses, we put up boards in winter to protect throwing snow on the roadway underneath or on pedestrian pathways. Um, you know, you could, at certain locations, you could build a wall or put up something permanent. Um, you know, that's, that's a choice that, a design choice that could be made. The new city LRT murals. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Morgan. I appreciate that. Thanks. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you, Councillor uh, Meehan. Uh, next, um, transportation services. Uh, we have uh, four um, uh, IPDs. Uh, Mr. Kanalakis has a presentation, then introduce the Fairness Commissioner who will have a presentation that will open it up to questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before I, uh, I start, I was um, just, to, just as an introduction, um, I'd like to also um, uh, introduce the experts that are at this table. In addition to Ray Mobucci, who have introduced uh, Jeff Gilbert, uh, Michael Morgan, and Isabel Jasmine, who are here. Of course, John is still here, and uh, Will McDonald, our Chief Procurement Officer, and Rick. We also have our Fairness Commissioner uh, here with us from uh, P3 Advisors, uh, Jillian Newsom, who would be on the far, the far end, and Louise Panathan, who's the President of P3 Advisors. Jillian, who many of you have met at the technical briefings, is the Senior Vice President of P3 Advisors and has worked with the firm since 2008. To date, she's participated in over 120 fairness uh, mandates. Louise is a familiar face to some of you. She's a president of P3 Advisors, 26 years of experience um, in procurement and 20 years of experience in fairness assignments. Uh, she's been a fairness commissioner on over 190 projects and has worked on 17 fairness mandates for the City of Ottawa dating back to 2003. So she brings, uh, she comes to the table with, um, with uh, joining our team of experts. Um, today, um, I just want to walk you through some of the, um, uh, the issues that have been raised over the last while uh, as a result of the inquiries and as a result of the, uh, the uh, staff meetings of councillors and uh, media uh, have been attending uh, over the last week. And I know every council member, not every media member, were able to, to attend those, so I'm trying to capture um, some of the discussion that happened, the questions, so that everyone uh, is on the uh, same uh, level playing field uh, before we open it up to uh, questions. On my first slide, um, 
I don't want to spend too, time on the, too much time on this because uh, Michael just went through it. But that council, I just want to talk about what council approved last March um, for a project that was defined by council in 2017, actually. Um, the procurement process was developed to address the fact that the winning proponent was having, having to design, build, finance, and maintain the system that council had already approved with the key elements that they wanted for the public. So the type of train had already been determined, the location of the maintenance facility had already been determined, the new airport link and extension to Lime Bank, and all the other system upgrades and enhancements were built into the RFP process. And these elements are referred to, and this was discussed in some of the meetings, uh, by procurement experts as output specifications. And it's a term you're going to be hearing uh, more about during the discussions today when we get to questions. Uh, it's also important to remember that using a P3 model was a condition of the federal and provincial funding we received for, uh, for Stage 2. Last Monday, uh, we released 2,122 pages of the documents that show from start to finish how the Trillium Line procurement was conducted and why the integrity of the process was confirmed by both the City's Independent Fairness Commissioners who are here today and by Council's Independent Auditor General. And I want to thank every member of uh, Council, uh, media and the public who took time to read through these documents because I think once you um, see the process for yourselves, you can see the time, care and due diligence um, that was taken at every step. You know, in hindsight, and I think this is the opportunity to say this to Council, we, we should have proactively released these documents as soon as the selective slices were made public through the media. It's critical that not only those of us who were involved know the process was fair and conducted in accordance with best practices, but that Council and the public can also see it for themselves. And I'm hoping that today we move closer um, to, that, uh, to that outcome. However, releasing actual procurement documents had never been done before that we could find here. And I want to thank Council for making that happen. I want, to know, want Council to know that going forward, we're going to be looking for guidance on how and when to best communicate with Council and the public during major commercially confidential procurements, keeping the Bellamy Inquiry cautions in mind and other, other constraints that we believe we had. We hope to begin that discussion with Council when we receive the results of the lesson learned report, which I think is a, is a, uh, a great idea for us to be able to build forward as we look at future large procurements. Finally, I want to thank all those members of councils and the media who took the time to attend the technical briefings and the people who are here today to answer your questions. Those briefings, as I said, gave us a good sense of what areas um, we need to be clear in our communications, and I think that's another area where, as you saw from our last in-camera briefing, these are complex projects and it's hard to distill them into uh, clear communication uh, narrative and tracks. Um, first was the issue of who developed the RFP, and the answer is a lot of experts working together. What wasn't clear was the fact that most of the RFP was templated. I don't think people know that the RFP was templated, and it was based on precedence, and the experts in each particular section of the RFP tailored the document to meet the city's requirements. So it was the technical experts from the owner's engineer team and staff that developed the technical criteria and output specifications, the financial experts who developed the financial requirements, and Norton Rose that ensured the legal requirements were met and that everything was reviewed and approved by the city team. Obviously, the technical evaluations were a focus of many questions, and I've tried to summarize the answers to the most common questions here. Namely, the scoring grid was a template based on industry precedents. It was developed by technical experts and it wasn't developed by our lawyers. The technical evaluations were qualitative and because of this there was training provided to the evaluators to try and standardize what does the 70% look like. Training the evaluators is an area the AG made recommendations for improvement for next time. The Bid Evaluation Steering Committee did not ask the evaluators to rescore the results. I cannot state this more clearly. The BESC asked the evaluation team's due diligence questions about how the first technical evaluation scores related directly to the output specifications in the RFP. That kind of due diligence is their job. It's one of their main roles of that committee, in fact. Both the decision to rescore all the technical submissions from all of the teams and the decisions on the scores were made solely by the technical evaluators. The steering committee made the decision to move the bidder with the lowest score to the financial evaluation stage without knowing who the bidder was or anything about their financial submission. I cannot state that strongly enough. We made the decision because it made sense, because it was reasonable, 
The RFP have allowed for it. The score was in 3% of the threshold and none of the issues that were identified in the technical submission were so severe that they couldn't and wouldn't be addressed in the contract negotiations if that bidder were the preferred proponent at the end of the day. We received legal advice to help inform our decision and you have seen all that, you've all seen that legal opinion. It told us among other things when looking at the RFP as a whole, a failure to achieve an applicable min minimal score did not constitute a material deviation but simply meant that the proposal was of poor quality which I'm on record of stating uh, recently. Unless the failed score was so fundamental that it fits one of the categories for material deviation and we have already established that none of them met that threshold. We made the decision to protect the city's interests. We knew that the end result of negotiating with any of the teams as a preferred proponent would mean ensuring that those parts of the technical bids that didn't meet the city's output specifications would in fact meet the city's requirements in the project agreement or they, or they wouldn't be the preferred proponent at the end of the process. The Fairness Commission confirmed that this was acceptable within the process. I also want to confirm that there was no outside informal hallway or off the record conversations between members of the BESC and the Executive Steering Committee on this or any part of this procurement, ever. All of our interactions in the procurement process were on record and overseen by the Fairness Commissioner. So we decided to move all three bids to the next phase with their scores unchanged and without knowing which team had which score. So now with respect to the financial submissions, I'd like to turn it over to uh, this part of the presentation to Deputy City Treasurer Isabel Jasmine who will clarify the major questions about the financial evaluation phase and how the fact that one bid was only, that the fact that one bid was only 6% higher doesn't actually mean that it was affordable to the city. Isabel. Thank you. Uh, so the financial evaluations were conducted separately from the technical evaluations. Two affordability caps were set, one for the construction period which was set at $663 million, and one for the contract in total including the maintenance period which, which was set at $1.7 billion. The affordability caps were based on the capped two-thirds funding from the federal and provincial governments. Any amounts above that cap would have to be funded by the city. Only Transit Next bid was below both affordability caps. All bidders were required to include the same price for the Stadler trains and all bidders were required to invest equity of $35 million minimum which would be paid back by the city over the term of the contract. Transit Next invested an additional $100 million in deferred capital which brought their construction period price below the cap without compromising the overall capital cost for the Trillium extension and maintaining the total contract price including maintenance below the total cap. Per the RFP, if only one bidder is affordable, all bidders continue on to the financial evaluation scoring stage. The financial score is based on a total of 500 points, 450 for the submission price and 50 points for the quality of the financing plan. Total price is calculated as the net present value of all construction period payments, vehicle costs, substantial completion payment, maintenance term service payments, maintenance term capital payments and life cycle payments. The maximum score of 450 points is assigned to the lowest price. 30 points are then deducted from the maximum score for every percentage point a pro proponent's price exceeds the lowest price bid. This slide provides an illustrative example using 1 billion as the lowest price and the scores achieved by the other bidders that range from 450 to 170 to 53 points out of 450. The affordability cap for the construction payments and for the total bid price, including maintenance, were critical to city being able to afford this project. The federal and provincial funding was based on a cap of $2.4 billion, which was equal to one-third of the $3 billion Stage 2 LRT project, and then adding 100% funding for the airport and trim extensions and $50 million for the line bank extension. Based on this cap, the city was funding $1 billion. It was this $1 billion in city funding that was built into the long-range financial plan and affordability model for the transit for the next 30 years. The affordability model then tests to ensure that we have a sufficient projected revenues. The projected revenue available for capital less, capital requirements for the next 30 years determines the debt required and the model ensures that debt servicing doesn't exceed our annual net revenue available. This amount fails, if, the, if this amount falls below zero in any year or in other words if we are in issuing debt to pay for debt which is not allowed then it is unaffordable. 
That is why the affordability caps are so important. They have an, import, they have an impact during the construction period and over the 30 years. If either is exceeded, the city must fund the difference and this impacts the feasibility of the capital plan going forward. Thank you, Isabel. The last part of the procurement process was a negotiation phase with the first proponent, which ended up being transit next. This part involved ensuring that the technical non-conformance issues identified in the technical evaluation phase were addressed to the city satisfaction and committed to by way of the project agreement before. Uh, my apologies, Steve. I'm actually going to have to uh, to put a hold on the meeting. We do not have quorum right now, so we have uh, staff just rallying everybody up. So my apologies, just hold your no horses. Problem. They forgot they think they're still in council. Okay, we've got quorum back. It was resting on one person's shoulder. No, I'm just joking. All right, thank you, Steve. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, the last part of the procurement process was the negotiation phase with Transit Next. This part involved ensuring that the technical nonconformance issues identified in the technical evaluation phase were addressed to the city's satisfaction and committed to by way of the project agreement before T Next was recommended to City Council as a preferred proponent. Because of all, all of the technical bid submission that had issues of non-conformance, and, I, and this is an important point, all of the, all of the technical bid submission had issues of non-conformance, this exercise would have been undertaken with whichever team had placed as a preferred proponent. If TNEX had not committed to the city's satisfaction to deliver the quality system council required within its bid price, the city would have moved on to the second place bid. But they did meet the requirements, and our, and our project agreement requirements never changed. They committed to meeting them, so they became the recommended proponent to council. In closing, I'm just going to go through the final bullets on these slides, because these are the last of the, of the, um, of the uh, issues that uh, arose that uh, required clarification. The technical conformance review established that the technical submission by all three proponents passed the go, no go conformance test for consideration that was expressly set out in the procurement documents. Any poor quality response to the technical submission requirements for the proponents in the technical evaluation phase does not reduce any of the proponents' obligations to meet project design, construction, maintenance, operations, and financing of the project agreement should they be selected as preferred proponents. All three proponents had issues that would have needed to be expressly addressed as part of the negotiations phase. The discretion exercised by the Executive Steering Committee with respect to the technical evaluation as recommended by the BESC was blind. No member of the committee knew which firm had which score and the discretion was exercised without any knowledge of the financial submission which the Fairness Commission confirmed as an acceptable practice from a fairness perspective. Contract negotiations addressed all of the deficiencies in Transit Next RFP submission before they were recommended as a preferred proponent of the City Council in the report that was considered on March 6, 2019. The executed project agreements require Transit Next to meet Council's criteria for the project design, construction, maintenance operations and financing for Stage 2 LRT Trillium Extension. Construction including early works and preliminary site pre preparations began in early 2019 as Michael just walked through. We're well on our way. The project is well within its scope. When completed in August of 2022, which isn't that far away, this project will provide new light rail connections for communities in Riverside South while bringing rail closer to Manatick, Finley Creek, Greeley, Osgood, and provide connections to bus service in Barhaven via the Vimy Memorial Bridge. Before we get to questions, I'd like to ask Louise from um, our Fairness Commission advisors um, to do a brief presentation on their role and answer some of the questions that require clarification, I think were illustrative uh, for members of, the, for members of uh, the media and of council. So Louise, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned by the city manager, my name is Louise Panaton. I'm the owner and president of P3 Advisors, um, a proud Ottawa-based uh, woman-owned business, so uh, thank you. 
Uh, so what I thought I'd start by doing is really telling you a little bit what a fairness commissioner does and what type of qualifications we have to undertake the work uh, that we perform. Similar to many other types um, of advisors, uh, fa fairness commissioners are typically selected based on experience, qualifications, integrity, and the confidence that uh, you, the uh, procurer of our services, have in the ability for us to deliver our mandate. As it relates to P3 advisors, uh, we were founded in uh, 2002. Uh, we've been engaged in uh, 190 fairness ma mandates at the municipal, provincial, and federal jurisdictions. And we've been involved in about uh, 60 public-private partnerships. None of the procurements uh, that we've been involved in have been successfully challenged. So we have a good reputation of observing these types of processes. Uh, in the last five years, we've been involved in procurements of approximately $23.5 billion and fairness mandates in excess of $32 billion. Just to give you a little bit of the scope of uh, what we're involved in. Uh, both Jill uh, Newsom and myself are also uh, repeated faculty members. Uh, at York U University's Osgood Certificate in training both in fairness and procurement. One of the things that's very important as it relates to our service offering uh, is that all of the P3 advisors' resources who work on mandates are trained and put through a rigorous program related to fairness. Finally, part of the qualifications we bring to the table is that fairness concerns that are raised through any of the processes we're involved in undergo peer review. So it's not a single person that makes a determination. We go through a, a very stringent peer review process. Um, in terms of our role on, on your project, uh, so for, for the Trillium um, RFP, we were selected through a public procurement process. Uh, and our role included reviewing and providing comments on the final draft of the RFP, reviewing comments on material that's communicated by the city to proponents, monitoring uh, in-person meetings, uh, and very important, ensuring that we monitor that the city is managing the procurement in accordance with the terms of the RFP. So what is set out in the RFP is the process that uh, we're, we are looking for the city to follow. Um, we act as facilitator in the case of uh, where, where there are some fairness issues that arise and any potential uh, issues through the process. And at the end, we prepare a written report that we deliver to the city on, on the process. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see that uh, as it relates to the evaluation process, which is an important part of any project, uh, we review all the documentation, including uh, the uh, framework, the evaluation frameworks. We observe the meetings, and uh, you know, as uh, the city manager mentioned, we participated in the uh, evaluation steering committee meetings. Uh, we advise the uh, bid evaluation steering committee on, on the adherence to the process by the evaluation participants, uh, and we participate in the review of the uh, potential conflicts of interests. At the end of the evaluation process, we provided an attestation confirming that the process had been managed in a, a fair manner. Um, the, the process uh, that the city adopted uh, had a strict uh, governance applied to it. One of the committees or teams that was set up as part of the process was the conflict review team. So what their role is uh, through the process, it was to assess the relationships uh, both with the participants and the proponents, so looking at it from both angles to identify whether there was a potential conflict of interest. Um, if there were uh, matters that were disclosed, then uh, the, uh, the conflict uh, review committee would make a recommendation and we would uh, opine or weigh in on uh, whether it was fair. 
Uh, again, uh, this uh, conflict review team provided uh, a report uh, and as part of the overall process uh, confirming that, uh, that the process from a conflict review pr perspective was, uh, was reasonable. So the Fairness Commissioner uh, is not a member of the conflict review team and this is generally the case in P3s. So this is not abnormal, it's what we typically see through these processes. So continuing on uh, as part of our role in the, in the process, we do participate in the review of conflict of interest. So all of the participants, the evaluation participants, sign a conflict of interest form and uh, those that disclose relationships are then escalated to the Fairness Commissioner uh, for us to look at them from a fairness perspective. Uh, there were uh, a few questions related to Norton Rose, so we do want to confirm that we were aware that uh, Norton Rose had existing client relationships with members of more than one proponent team uh, as it relates to the project. Um, they disclose a relationship and uh, information that provided, uh, that was provided, uh, supported the decision that for, of the conflict review to committee that uh, we were comfortable from a fairness perspective, there was no conflict. Uh, it's also important to note that these types of relationships with legal advisors are not abnormal in P3, in the P3 industry. Uh, moving on to the discretionary clause, so it was um, a matter that we looked at uh, in, in a lot of detail as the city was considering applying uh, this discretionary clause. And if you look at the first bullet under I, uh, the element that was considered from a fairness perspective uh, with the, the greatest attention was the severity of the failure to achieve uh, the application of the minimal score. So if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, a, a few things that are important to note. Uh, one of the things we're looking at through the, our mandate is to ensure that proponents uh, have equal access in terms of the, the overall information that's provided. So this clause was disclosed in the RFP. Uh, we'd also like to note that it was more substantive than clauses that uh, we would typically see in these types of procurements. Um, and in particular, uh, the fact that they, it identified the factors that would be considered through the application of the discretionary clause. And in particular, as I mentioned, the severity of the failure to achieve the applicable minimum score. So from a fairness perspective, the elements that we considered uh, were the proximity of the final score to the threshold, which was less than 3%, and the significance of the elements that led to the score being lower than 70% based on the input and experience from the BESC. So those were the elements considered through the, um, the application. As it relates to the legal opinion, uh, the BESC obtained a legal opinion uh, related to the risk of not applying the discretionary clause. Um, engaging a fairness commissioner doesn't preclude the city uh, from obtaining legal opinions. Uh, P3 advisors, however, did not consider the legal opinion in the assessment of the application of the clause from a fairness perspective. In conclusion, uh, at the end of the process, we were satisfied that, and we attested to the fact that uh, the process was conducted um, in a fair manner, manner uh, and uh, that it was open and transparent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, before we proceed to questions, and I know we have a, a list going, because we're coming on the seven o'clock uh, time period, we need to pass a motion to continue with that. So I'll turn it to Councillor Tierney. Tim. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee approve that the meeting be extended past 7 p.m. pursuant to subsection 8.1c of the procedural bylaw 2019-8. All in favor? Yes. Carried. All right, we'll turn to questions. Uh, Councillor El Shantiri, you're first on the list. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And my apologies to the Fairness Commission because I, earlier I didn't know it was going to be a presentation, but I'm glad I waited and heard your full presentation. Uh, I did, as I indicated earlier, I did uh, had the opportunity to meet with staff and legal, uh, uh, and I met with the Fairness Commission as well. Can you tell a little bit more about the independent of, of the Fairness Commission when, when he or she, in general, attend those meetings? Uh, so, um, a couple of elements that are very important as it relates to both our firm and our approach. Uh, so, P3 Advisors uh, has made a very conscious decision not to work with any of the bid teams on any mandate. So, we don't have any relationships as it relates to any of the bid teams or any of their, their subs. So, we are impartial to um, any of the proponent teams. Um, the second element to consider as you're looking at the independence is that we do not draft the documentation. So I think that's another element to really consider as, as you're looking at our role in particular. Uh, we're looking at the documents and the positions that are being taken by the various committees from an outside perspective and then can, can take an impartial view um, as it relates to, to that. Um, we, we do look at the structure of, and composition, especially as it relates to the evaluation committees and the governance that set out, um, again, to ensure that uh, the, the pieces of, of this evaluation uh, process support uh, an, an independent process from beginning to end. My, my other question to you, and I, I, so I'm trying to wrap my mind about uh, the delegated authority council give to staff to basically uh, through the whole process. And I'm not sure who's going to answer, but I just want to make sure have staff stayed with the framework of the, the uh, delegate authority council uh, ask to, for staff to, uh, to work with. Have you reviewed that portion of it? So I can speak to the, um, the governance of yes. the project and uh, the overall um, implementation. Uh, and in terms of the delegation of authority, would refer it back to the city in terms of how that, uh, that progressed. Uh, so the, the process and the various committees that were set up, again, were very similar to processes set up in other P3s or large projects of this nature. Uh, so having uh, uh, independent and essentially having subcommittees of evaluators that were empowered to score and, and in fact instructed and trained on scoring against a uh, pre-established approved evaluation framework is leading practice. Um, having an evaluation committee uh, such as you did through the bid evaluation steering committee is also leading practice where essentially each, each one of the evaluation teams reports back in and the BESC then uh, acts uh, in terms of applying due diligence, uh, in, again, in relation to the RFP and the evaluation committee. So again, you've got the layer one, which is the people evaluating, layer two, which is ensuring due diligence and that each one of the various teams undertook their, their duties uh, in, uh, in the manner instructed. And then finally, the, um, the uh, executive steering committee uh, that in fact received the recommendation and made the final determination. So each one of these steps are standard steps that we would see in a project of this nature um, and provide a lot of assurance from a fairness perspective that you have the checks and balances in place uh, so that you have the result that you're seeking. And, okay, Ms. Mr. Um, Madam Chair, the other thing that, um, you know, I don't want to, I'm referencing the Auditor um, General's um, uh, report and uh, where he basically was asked specifically to look at the delegated authority that was given to staff. And um, um, I'm just looking, trying to find the part uh, that, his conclusion was that we did 
follow the um, um, delegated authority that was given to council. There were no issues with that. So I, I reference council back to the, you know, I'm not going to speak for the auditor general, I don't believe he's here, but I reference councillors back to the audit report, which had a comprehensive um, explanation of the process that he reviewed and what his findings were and his recommendations. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kanalakis. Uh, what I, because I asked the question when I met with the, with the team is about if the Fairness Commission itself uh, check on the governing part. Have, have we followed the approach? Have we have followed the best practice? We give you delegate authority. Have you stepped out of that delegate authority? So we heard twice now, one from the Editor General and one from the Fairness Commission. Process was followed through. The only problem I would, I, I have to make my comment, Madam Vice Chair, is the communication, the availability for, you know, we met with uh, with the team, with the senior team, the, uh, the procurement officer, the, the fairness commission, and the legal, but after the fact. I would love to have that, you know, during the, you know, to, I'm not sure how much can you relieve, but I mean, to be able to see some of the document and understand that process it would have been very helpful to be able to answer some of the community's concern, especially when it comes to uh, you know, how you develop that criteria, how did you arrange it. And I, I read some of the number and I know some of them hidden for a good reason, but I mean, process has been followed. I just don't understand why didn't, why didn't we show it before and, and make, make sure that the, the media and the community and all of us included understand that full process. Well, I think that, uh, you know, with, with hindsight, you know, we're looking back at how this whole thing, whole thing evolved. Um, we were in March of 2019 um, before council um, approving um, the recommendation from staff who exercised their delegated authority the council provided to several years ago in terms of the process, yes. which uh, the Auditor General and the Fairness Commissioner said they followed it. Um, then, um, you know, as more information was coming out from a media perspective, we ended up with the Auditor General being retained for, to look at the audit, and we went into a silent period while he audits. Staff, we don't comment when an audit's, as part of the protocol of the Auditor General, we don't comment when an audit's underway, because he was reviewing and interviewing all the staff and seeking all the documentation. Um, and then he sh comes in back in, I think it was uh, November of, of 2019 or thereabouts, I don't remember the date, where he basically said process was followed, it was fair, transparent, and there were, but there were a number of recommendations, fair enough. But that's what I think the lessons learned report that we're going to, and you're gonna talk about today, the scope document is for. It's to go and look and say, despite what we did, despite the fact that, yeah, it followed the rules of the time, is that, the best way to do it in a public procurement with council, with the public and everyone else, and still retain some kind of uh, discipline and protection to city council in the city in terms of a live procurement process. I want to know the answer to that too. Um, it's not every day that uh, city staff are doing multi-billion dollar um, procurements. That's, that's a fact. And so, and it's outside of our normal procurement bylaw. It was a separate process that was set up uh, as directed uh, by council as part of the initial recommendations of the report. And I welcome the lessons learned report to say, okay, if we can do better, let's do better. Let's change our processes. Let's have checkpoints to communicate with uh, council. Let's have a different communication protocol and still be able to respect the, the, um, the, uh, the ultimately any challenges or protect ourselves from any challenges from potential bidders or any other things that can come up. I'd love to find that balance and I'm welcoming that, uh, that report and I think the scope document that uh, a committee is going to be uh, dealing with shortly um, uh, sets the stage for us to look at all those things. Uh, if I may, Madam uh, Chair, to the Fairness Commissioner, how, how, how long have you been working with the city on a P3? And, uh, because I do remember in 2006, we worked together at some point for the P3 in my community. Yeah, so I've, uh, I've been working with the city since 2003 on various fairness yes. mandates. Uh, and so for this specific procurement, we, uh, we were selected in April of 2017. Uh, for the RFP process and uh, the RFQ process. 
uh, but we were involved in other uh, public-private yes. partnerships uh, with with the city uh, going back to the Shankman Center. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Merci, Madame la Députée. Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. I, I appreciate that I had met with staff uh, and uh, my questions were, were answered, yet it, since I began to read some of the, the information, I, I got caught up on the initial point, which is, can I understand why did we set out 70%? I come from the sport world. If you're anywhere, you have a goal to achieve, you, do, you achieve that goal or you don't. So I want to understand how the 70% was established, and what is the in purpose of having a percentage point? <clears throat> Madam Chair, I'll start. 70% um, is a, a benchmark that's been selected by Infrastructure Ontario in connection with its LRT projects, both the ones where it's been sponsor, as well as where it's been advisor. And it's considered uh, a best practice point uh, in those projects. And so I think uh, the, the city team, uh, looking at that issue, felt it was the right starting point. I don't know if anybody else has any further guidance to provide on that point, but that's the starting point. Ma Madam Chair, I can try as well. Uh, the 70 points itself, the 70%, I, I don't think you'll find, if you were looking for a technical study that says, that makes a direct correlation between 70 points being, let's say, a, a, a compliance factor when you're looking at an output specification. Uh, what 70% really meant and the way it, it, it is intended to be applied. And I think uh, the, the city manager men mentioned this earlier on when he was talking about the evaluate, evaluation matrix and some of the training is, and when I've done training with evaluators in the past, I didn't do it here, I would say the 70 is the minimum requirement. The minimum requirement could be 50. That could, you, the 70 could be a 50, it could be an 80. It's just it's basically just the baseline that you're starting from. And the objective when you're doing a qualitative evaluation as, as you are on a technical basis, what you try to train the evaluators to do is say, the 70 gets you what, you want, what the output specification says, and then from the 70 up to, the, up to 100, everything's out of 10. So from up, up above the 7 to the 10, 10 is like they've more than exceeded it, right? Now, could the 70 be a 60? Could the 60 be a 50? Yes. And then you would just say, well, then in the case of it being a 50, the 50 is the baseline. So the 70 itself doesn't have any significance from a technical perspective. I've never seen a study done by an engineering firm that says 70 points tells you it's, it's, uh, it's technically compliant. It's just basically a, an industry standard, a, a, as Mr. Gilbert has said, that Infrastructure Ontario has used as the baseline, and I think it also gives the connotation when you see technical scores, you know, 70 is a B minus, B plus, right? If you, if you set it at 50, it just doesn't have the same visual, it doesn't have the same impact as it would if you had set it at 70. So there, there's, it, it is a very, it, it, frankly, it's somewhat arbitrary. Right, but we still set that threshold. So I, I want to understand further. So. The group meets with the proponents, does their evaluation, identifies strengths and weaknesses, and, and those charts are very helpful, and then um, fail one of the proponents, or one of the proponents doesn't meet the 70%. So then they submit the report into, I'll call it the professional group of, uh, of folks, I, I'm sorry, the name escapes me, uh, the Evaluation Steering Committee, is that possible? The Bid Evaluation Steering Committee, okay. correct. So uh, then that group says, hey, we want you to, we, we recognize it's rare that someone fails, but we want you to, tight, to tighten up your evaluation to make sure that we're secured. So, but to me, that is a position of conflict. If I'm, if I'm a, a university professor, it, put, it, put yourself like this, you're, you're judging diving. You judge all the competitors, and then at the end of it, you know the results, the final results of each group, although I recognize you, you have to view them separately, and I know who failed, and I'm asking, that, I'm asking you as an overall to review your entire process. I don't understand how that is not a bias. I don't understand how we're not 
putting ourselves in a position of bias towards those evaluators. The, the, there's no bias. The framework, the process is set up for the bid evaluation committee to undertake that diligence of those scores. So if I can provide your diving example, if the requirement of the competition was that someone do a triple flip and when you got the score back, the person did a triple flip, but they did a quadruple flip. And then the bid evaluation steering committee would say, well, wait a minute, wasn't the requirement about a triple flip? How did this quadruple flip in influence your score? That's the kind of questioning that we as a bid evaluation steering committee are supposed to do. We're supposed to make sure that the evaluator's uh, scoring is based on RFP requirements. And so we questioned them on that and we said to them, Make sure you answer these questions for all the proponents. All the proponents have these kinds of questions. And if you believe it is necessary, you the technical evaluators, because we're not the technical evaluators, then go ahead and rescore. And that's what they did, and they reported back to us. So I want to understand, what is the, um, the bid evaluation uh, steering committee? What's their authority? Because you have your group of evaluators, then you have this group. How can that group have authority to send something back? It's a an advisory, like what's, what's its authority? So its authority is derived from the framework. Again, everybody is trained on the framework. Everybody is trained on how the process will be set up. As uh, P3 advisors have said, bid evaluation steering committee is a, is a best practice in a procurement to have a diligence check to make sure that in fact the technical evaluators are matching bid requirements together with scores. So it, it's not hidden to anybody. This is exactly how the evaluation framework was set up. Okay. So if, then the if I could just add as well from a fairness uh, perspective, this is not abnormal. So on the, on the P3 projects that we are involved in, it is, it is customary for the evaluation committee or the equivalent of the bid evaluation committee to send back uh, the uh, questions to the evaluators. And it could be questions of clarification in terms of language used to represent what's in the, uh, the information that's shared. So what, what they have said, a little bit like the example that was provided on the three flips versus two. Uh, or areas where uh, there, there are questions on the score in relation to the comments that came back. So this is, this is a normal process that, that we have seen, I would say, on all of the large P3 procurements we've been involved in. It is not abnormal. But we were told If I may, sorry, just add one more point out, sorry, Councillor, <coughs> is we would actually been negligent our duties as bid evaluation, and being a member, as I was a member on bid evaluation steering committee, if we didn't read the results and if we didn't ask the questions we did, we would have been negligent of, of our responsibility, that, that we were doing the job that we had been asked to do in the evaluation framework. But the bid evaluation steering committee yeah, I, I mean, to me, it's, it's odd because when, I, when we met the other day, you said, we've never, I've, I've, I asked a couple of, uh, of, of you up front, how often does a proponent not meet the minimum threshold? All of you said, oh, I've never seen that. It's the first time I see that. So there's something unique in this case. I, I don't know, you, but, you weren't at the But meeting. I want to distinguish that, Councillor, from someone not meeting a threshold to us having a diligence session where technical evaluators base their evaluation and diligence requirements in a manner that's defensible. Quite often, sitting on bid evaluation steering committees, we have to ask evaluators questions about how it is they're coming to their results. In fact, as Mr. Bushi said, it's, it's part of the job of a bid evaluation steering committee. So sending evaluators questions back and having them understand how they've rooted their evaluation is an essential part of the process. Mr. Bucci, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Yeah. Maybe just it reiterate a couple of points. You're only dealing with the lead of the technical evaluation committee, so you never actually interact with the evaluators, the individual evaluators themselves. And at no time, it's very carefully structured. We do not give instructions to score. It's not our job. You won't see in the evaluation uh, framework bid evaluation steering, steering committee to comment on scoring. That is not something that, 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 we, that, that is our responsibility. So when you go back and or you go back and you ask questions of either the financial or technical evaluation team, it has to be clearly scripted. It has to be reviewed by multiple parties before it goes through, including the procurement leads, including fairness, to make sure you're not leading the evaluators. 
And what you're trying to do is just give the evaluators a little bit more instruction because you saw something that you thought might not have been uh, completely consistent with the criteria they're evaluating against. So I just want to understand, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I can't see that far. I think it's Louise. Louise Panton. Merci. Bonjour. Alors, moi, c'est une... Yes, so I have a question for you. Uh, so uh, the group that I met said, I've never seen a situation of all of the experts at the table said, I've never seen a group uh, that uh, made a submission and wasn't able to meet minimum requirements. Did you, have you ever seen a situation like this? Not what, it, this is not, this is, does, doesn't apply to the technical evaluation. It, um, as my colleagues have explained at the table, it's, um, it is necessary to apply due diligence in uh, the, um, as described in the documentation in the RFP document. So it's important uh, to exercise our role as evaluators and to make sure that what is presented is coherent and especially uh, that it's uh, congruent with the uh, RFP and the uh, framework, evaluation frameworks. Those are the two criteria that we use. And as I said, um, it's, uh, this is a fairly standard project in uh, this kind of project. And uh, so I would like to also... Um, so we, we did, uh, team, members of my team participated in all of the meetings with the BESC, with the ESC, and as uh, the BESC sent back uh, some, some very clear questions to the evaluators, again, our team was represented in those meetings to ensure that there was consistency in, in the manner in which they were applied. So we were there every step of the way. Okay, thank you. I want to go back. So the group sends, or the BESC sends back to, for a revaluation. The revaluation, everyone sort of bumps up, but hey, there's still an anomaly. There's a group that still doesn't meet the, the 70. So at that point, a decision's made to go to executive committee. And at my meeting, I asked, this is all about how the risk was identified to the executive group. And I'm told, read the minutes. The minutes are very generic, and they say there's a verbal update. But then I find this document that was provided um, on, for that meeting on October 26th. And I'm surprised by that recommendation because I thought that PSC, uh, that the uh, Built Evaluation Steering Committee was advisory. But I'll, on one of the slides, I'll read the point. It says, BSC is recommending the continued ev uh, evaluation of this proponent's proposal and ask ESC to confirm this recommendation and the, rec the, uh, the continued consideration of this proposal. So obviously, BSC, in my mind, in this case, needs to act as a neutral agent. But it's advising executive, uh, executive committee as to how to... Uh, to proceed, so I'm, I'm curious to understand it better. I, I think if you look at the framework and you look at uh, all, all of the guidelines that were set up, there was no requirement for BESE to be a neutral body. We were required to be a fair body that upheld the principles of the RFP. And so in looking at all of the different options, we made a recommendation to Executive Steering Committee. It was their decision ultimately as to what to do, but I think it was entirely appropriate for us to make a recommendation and provide them with some guidance based on what we had seen. In particular, as you think about the factors that permit the exercise of that discretion, we as the Bid Evaluation Steering Committee were closest to those items. Mr. Bucci, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I would distinguish between look, not looking down, that's not a good way to say it, but dealing with the evaluation, uh, the evaluators, the financial technical evaluators, we, we provide due diligence, just ask, ask questions. Hey, one, one, of the, one of the roles of uh, Bid Evaluation Steering Committee is, as Mr. Gilbert is saying, is to advise the Executive Steering Committee. As is the case with any uh, uh, analysis of options, you go forward with an analysis of options, you do some sort of weighing of pluses and minuses, um, it, because otherwise the, the meeting needs a little bit of structure, and then the Evaluation Steering Committee has at its disposal the analysis that was done and could either accept the recommendation or go in a different direction. That's a fairly standard approach. I'd also like, I'd also like to add, uh, Madam Chair, that 
in the framework, it is the role of the Executive Steering Committee, which comprises myself, uh, Rick O'Connor, John Manconi, and uh, our former treasurer, Marion Similik, to make that decision. Um, so ultimately, the way the thing was set up, they had to come to the Executive Steering Committee to get that approval to put them through. So they brought a recommendation based on a set of circumstances that they came upon and were dealing with. Otherwise, what, you can't just show up to the meeting and say, we have these scores, what do you want to do? They brought forward a, a, a presentation that said, we have an issue here that you need to be made aware of. Here's our recommendation based on our discussion. And then we flushed that out. We, we had to uh, make a conscious decision uh, to accept um, that recommendation, which we did. So just to note, the time clock was going while Councillor Fleury was waiting for his response. He had 23 seconds. So if you have a very quick question, feel free to Well, I'll to get back in. on. I'll get back on. That's fine. Okay. All right. Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for the opportunity to meet with you previously and uh, you helped answer some of my questions. Still some remain, though. Some, some anomalies seem to remain. So... Um, the, the Bid Evaluation Steering Committee, the Technical Evaluation Steering Committee, they were not blind bids. They knew the technical scores that had come back. But the Executive Steering Committee, that was, it was supposed to be a blind bid for them. They weren't aware of the technical uh, scores that had come back that SNC or Lavalin had received a, a sub-threshold score. Did anyone else outside of those committees, outside of the Bid Evaluation Steering Committee and the Technical Evaluation Committee, um, were they made aware of the technical score received by SNC Lavalin? Anyone else outside of those committees? Uh, perhaps just the administrative team that was part of the evaluation coordination function because uh, the folks that would have been in, in, the, uh, in the consensus meetings helping take the notes that would have been in our bid evaluation steering committee taking the notes. But other than that, that's it. And, and by the way, they're identified in the evaluation framework as coordinators or procurement leads. Uh, so they are basically non-scoring members and not due diligence members of BSC, and they're just helping the project management of, of the process. And who, who were those staff, sorry? The city staff, or are they? A combination. A combination of yeah. city staff and? Yeah, they were part of the integrated program uh, project management team, correct? They're, they're, I, I don't have it offhand, but they're in the- City staff and owner's engineer team, I think. Right, it's a combination, yeah. Okay. Um, when Norton Rose Fulbright was writing the legal opinion, um, though, those, those lawyers writing that legal opinion uh, were informed of the technical score of SNC Lavala. Yes, the two lawyers, uh, Martin Mass and Stephen Natras, were aware of the identity of the proponent. Okay, and so in terms of uh, Mr. Stephen Natras, can you confirm um, that at least you know, one of those lawyers that wrote the opinion was also working for SNC Lavalin at the time? As we've explained before, uh, Norton Rose Fulbright declared its conflicts to the Fairness Commissioner and to the city with all proponents where we had a relationship. In this mandate, our only client was the City of Ottawa, and that's who we do owed our duty of loyalty to, and that's who we acted in the best interests of. And that goes for every lawyer at the city. Our conflicts were not lawyer specific. They were for every lawyer at the firm who was acting on behalf of another proponent on unrelated matters. As we've explained, this is something that happens all the time in this space and is not unusual. Was that individual working for both the city and uh, working on that legal opinion for the city at the time he was working for SNC-Lavalin? As we've explained before, and as a matter of public record, the firm has had a relationship with SNC, but they were not our client in respect of this matter. In respect of this matter, we owed the duty of loyalty to the City of Ottawa, and we discharged that duty of loyalty and acted only in the City of Ottawa's interests. To the Fairness Commissioner, did you evaluate Mr. Stephen Natras uh, in the terms of a conflict of interest in this case, or City staff? Uh, we did not uh, receive a conflict of interest form for Mr. Natras. Uh, so uh, two points I'd like just to bring up. First is we only received forms for individuals where uh, there was uh, a statement related to a relationship. So that's the first. Um, however, in the case of Mr. Natras, because he was not an evaluation participant, we would not have expected to receive uh, a conflict of interest form. 
He was not part of the evaluation. He was not an evaluation participant, which was that those are the, the individuals who completed the conflict of interest forms. How was it that they could be made aware of the technical score then? It was the subject matter of the opinion that they were providing, right? They were providing an opinion about the exercise of discretion. And as a result, they had to understand, that, as we've said, the very clear factors that may or may not permit the exercise of that discretion, one of which is the closeness of the score to the threshold. So they were aware of all the facts and circumstances in order to provide the best possible opinion to the city on the subject so that the city's interests were protected at all times. Okay, and Mr. Gilbert, you were the one who informed uh, your colleagues, I presume? Uh, no, I was not the one who informed my colleagues. Martin Mass was the legal subject matter expert throughout the course of the evaluations. Uh, I was a member of the BID Evaluation Steering Committee, as you know, so Martin Mass would have been well aware of the scoring because he was uh, participating in the training, participating in the legal subject matter expert questions that came along. So. Martin was fully aware he did not need me to inform him. Okay, anything. so through Martin Mass, Stephen Natras found out about the score. I assume somehow Martin and Stephen communicated that. Okay, uh, did the city seek any other additional legal review or analysis of the Norton Rose Fulbright opinion, the legal opinion that gave uh, merit to allowing SNC-Lavalin to continue in the process? At, at the time, we did not. Okay, and why did you not? Because we had... Uh, Procured a a, um, a, um, a an agreement with a law firm. It went through the procurement process. It was clear, and the decision of the executive steering committee at the time on this matter was not solely based on legal advice. And in fact, we did not see the legal ramifications um, 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 uh, letter. They were advised. Uh, or, 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 the team was advised, the BESC was advised by our fairness commissioners to in fact not bring that legal opinion. So our discussion um, at the executive steering committee was based on a number of factors. Um, one of which, yes, we got into the legal portion, but it was not the sole matter in terms of um, whether we made the decision. So I did not feel at the time that I needed validation of the legal opinion because the legal opinion was not the thing that triggered the decision solely to be able to move forward. And to the Fairness Commissioner, why did you instruct not to bring that legal opinion? Um, so we, we asked that the consideration for the purposes of the application of the discretionary right be based on the language in the RFP at the onset. So the recommendation moving to the ESC, as I mentioned before, was based on the proximity of the final scores, which was less than 3%, and the significance of the elements uh, of the scores that were lower than 70% based on what the BESC indicated. So in terms of the recommendation, it was based on what was in the RFP. The city, as I mentioned before, as do many of the clients we work with, uh, retain the right to seek legal advice when they're considering making a decision of this nature. So they they did that in their right to obtain information on, on the risks uh, associated with making the decision. But the recommendation was based on the elements that were considered part of the RFP process. Okay, so that memo was, or the, the legal opinion was drafted but not, not uh, given to the executive steering committee. There was two, there was two legal opinions, but that, the one we're talking about was not given to them. And, there, and I'm hearing that you folks recommended against giving that opinion. I'm asking why. For, because the recommendation that moved forward was based on the elements that, that form part of the RFP. So first the recommendation was to be based on the language in the RFP and the considerations that we've indicated. So our, our uh, again, our recommendation to the city was begin with the elements in your RFP and they, they made very solid, clear, statements related to each of the elements that were considered. And as I mentioned, then the city could consider whatever other elements they desired as part of the overall final decision. But the recommendation be based on, on the elements in the RFP. Okay, it's not clear to me. 
based on the specific legal opinion, though, why you'd say that shouldn't go. The other elements, I understand. I'm going to ask a question about that. But why on the specific legal opinion that shouldn't go, in addition to the other elements? I understand the RFP on the other elements. But, but why not the legal opinion? I'm, I'm trying to zero in on that. Without the RFP information, why not that opinion? So, so our role as part of the evaluation process is to confirm that they followed the evaluation process and the language set out in the RFP. So the language set out in the RFP actually set out the, the elements that the discretionary rights could be applied against. So, so we asked that the city element. focus that... on those elements. Okay, so this was not actually an element that the, the, the Executive Steering Committee should have paid attention to in any way. The Executive Committee, again, is a little bit different than, than the BESC. The Executive Committee are the decision makers on behalf of the, of the city. So essentially, what was recommended had to stay, in our, from our perspective, from a fairness perspective, needed to stay aligned with the RFP. Again, once the recommendation was made, so which it was, then the city could consider other matters in making your decision to proceed. Initially, the legal opinion did not align with the RFP. Uh, we, we can't comment on the legal opinion. We did not see the legal opinion, so it's not, uh, we, can't, we can't make that comment. You didn't see it before it went? We, we did not see the legal opinion. Okay. Uh, we've heard very clearly from staff that it wasn't just a legal opinion that kept snc Lavala um, in the bidding, that there were other factors. Can you please detail what those other factors were? The so factors that uh, Louise just went through, we discussed um, the process. Um, from my recollection, we, we discussed the process that, that the bid evaluation steering committee went through um, to look at the, um, uh, the scores and the questions they had against the RFP and why it was sent back and how that happened. We discussed um, um, the score being so close to the threshold and the fairness and reasonableness of turning away that score and what would it mean if you continued with that score through the process and we were told that and advised that um, the proponent who we didn't know who it was uh, would carry through that score um, heading into the into the uh, into the next stage um, we talked about the elements that led to the scores that were below 70 percent we talked about um, when we got to the legal part about material deviation, it was so significant that they should be excluded. And we talked about were we being reasonable in excluding a proponent that's uh, less than three points or 3% off of the minimum threshold when we have a discretionary clause and what would it mean if we didn't use the discretionary clause in terms of ultimately in front of the courts and the reasonableness of the city and fairness of the city in dealing with that. Um, I also remember asking questions about what would the options be of the proponent based on the fact that the bid prices uh, were expiring, based on the fact that the provincial and federal funding uh, uh, signature uh, timelines were expiring, um, based on um, um, the fact that uh, the worry was that, uh, that um, we'd have to go back out uh, to market ultimately if that happened, and what would be the significance, what would be the ability of the proponent um, to hold us up and how strong a case would they have in front of a judge um, with respect to uh, us turning them away for three points when the issues that they that failed to get them to 70 were not of such significance that couldn't ultimately be rectified and the final piece was and I remember asking this question when would we have the last opportunity to ensure that they actually met the technical requirements before it went to council and I was advised, and which is what ended up happening, that if that particular proponent, proponent C, I think, was, as it was labeled, made it through and actually was the uh, lowest bid and had the, the highest score ultimately, that they would not go before council until all the technical requirements we were satisfied and that they were built into the contract. So I felt that there was an off-ramp as a chair of the committee that if they proceeded through and could not satisfy us that the things that they wrote in that part of the procurement process, um, the poorly written uh, material, was not satisfied so that the outputs were still respected and that the contract reflected what was in our RFP, that we would not have recommended them to council. So I felt I had an op ramp um, to be able to basically turn away that proponent despite what their final score was if they didn't satisfy us. 
once they met, got into negotiations, of which uh, I believe Michael was involved in, um, it came back that they satisfied all the requirements of which the documentation you have, and therefore um, validated putting them through because we ended up with, um, with the, the proponent that ultimately was recommended. At any time, did you consider that they could be the lowest financial uh, bid? Was that ever a consideration for you? Um, not at all. In fact, um, I can remember um, in my own mind um, trying to guess who the proponent might be, and I was actually surprised when I saw the final score who it actually was. I guessed the wrong person. I did not, um, um, I thought that they, quite frankly, I thought they would be disadvantaged going forward because they carried the lower score, and we did not change their score to allow them to go forward. So I thought they'd be disadvantaged, quite frankly, if the final uh, financials were that close, whereby those points would have affected them negatively in winning the final, uh, the final bid, or being the, 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 the recommended proponent. Even though the weighting was the way it was, you still felt that it could be so close that they may have I had no, I had no idea, or none of us had any idea what the, uh, what the financials would be, or how close they would be, or whether they were over cap or anything. We had, we had no idea. We were dealing with the matter at hand, which is one proponent that was three points off, and what do we do with them? Okay, uh, Mr. Morgan, why did the evaluation team choose to rescore? <clears throat> so when we, we met and we, uh, we received the, the direction from BESC, and uh, <clears throat> you know, we went back and for, for every kind of comment that they provided back to us, we went back to that, that section. And in fact, we went through the entire document. We, we went through all the sections and made sure that uh, <clears throat> there was a clear linkage between uh, the specific comment we made and, uh, and, and the score and, and the requirements. Uh, made sure that there was kind of clear linkage and that it could be defendable. And in some cases, we found that uh, comments, uh, you know, needed to be tightened up or were washed away. And then what we were left with uh, didn't necessarily, you know, provide good rationale for the score. And so we, adju we adjusted where we thought it was appropriate. And we did that across the board for all three teams. Uh, you know, there was a general kind of uptick in all the scores. Uh, but... Uh, but we felt that the end product that we provided after the direction was much stronger and much more defendable in terms of uh, potential scrutiny at a later date. Okay, so after the bid evaluation, evaluation steering committee comes back with their uh, analysis or questions, um, it's at that point that you know, it's not that you just see those, you make a decision, the committee makes a decision to rescore at that point. Right, it's a consensus. Based right. on consensus, we, we reviewed our comments and updated the comments, and we reviewed the scores and updated the scores. Okay, and you didn't feel pressure at any time uh, to, to do so. You weren't feeling pressure from that. I read the questions. I, I might have felt pressure right. uh, if I was there, based on the questions I was seeing on each of those elements. Right. Uh, but you, 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 you folks felt... We, you know, we, we knew that we had full autonomy to do as we thought was appropriate, okay. and so we scored it how we thought was appropriate. Okay, um, Question to staff is, when was the mayor's office informed prior to the council meeting of March 6th that SNC Lavalin failed to meet the technical score? Yes, the, um, the, uh, I went back and looked at that on March 4th. At, uh, well, actually what happened, I just, I'll give a bit of background. There was a meeting inquiry concerning the 70% that, uh, that came in. And um, we uh, met, staff met only um, on... Um, with Mr. Gilbert uh, on March 4th at 1 o'clock to 1.30 to discuss um, the, uh, the discretionary score and the fact we had a media inquiry and what our response would be to that and uh, how we would deal with that at Council. At this point, Council obviously was set for March 6th. On March uh, 5th, the next day from 12.45 to 1.45, um, I organized a meeting where I uh, briefed um, the Mayor with um, um, uh, our executive steering committee, um, and uh, we walk through preparation for council, the roadmap, the motions, uh, the stage two report issue, and we also talked about the uh, 2019 budget, believe it or not. And so uh, that was the agenda for that meeting where we updated them on as chair of uh, council 
what he could expect in terms of um, the staff response to that. At no time before that uh, had there been a conversation uh, with the mayor concerning the executive steering committee, uh, dealing with the um, discretion, application of the discretionary clause or any other matter, in fact, uh, related to the um, to the uh, process, the confidential process that was taking place among staff and its advisors. Okay, so the mayor's office was aware prior to the March 6th meeting that uh, SNC-Lavalin, the bidder for the, the Trillium line, hadn't met the technical score. The day before, that's day correct. Day before, okay. Uh, how long after um, that meeting was it contemplated to release that information? Because we had gone through this thing where we were asking questions at that meeting. It seemed like there was some evasiveness happening there because you didn't feel you could, you could say that score. Uh, but we, you, you were saying that, that they were the lowest financial bid uh, around the time. So I guess how could we, you know, what was the contemplation of staff after that of how to release that information? Um, well, you know, the, the, the council meeting itself, I think that, um, um, you know, based on our legal advice at the time, that um, we didn't release it because as um, we've seen in further discussions, um, the, the risk, of course, was that a discussion would incur that um, was uh, dealing with material that the bidders would not have known in advance was part of the process. So you're exposing yourself to introducing, um, introducing a, a, an input into the final decision, the procurement process, after you delegated it to staff, which would impact that. The decision to, um, um, to release the documents was um, made uh, once we got the clearance from the, and I forget the exact terminology from the, um, what's it called? The, uh, the waivers from the other. Yeah, the waivers system. from the, um, we were still exposed because um, we had to uh, get the waivers signed off by the losing proponents. Um, and the winning proponents and so that um, the confidentiality and they, they wouldn't be suing the city or taking action against the city. So the decision was made uh, shortly after council meeting that once we achieved those waivers, which took several months, and for one of them it took a lot longer, quite frankly, it was European-based, um, that would, then we would release the information when we were safe. Okay. Uh, I'll, I might get back on. Uh, I, I have other questions. So... Just as a point of clarification, uh, Mr. City Manager, in any regular, any procurement process, when you're dealing with competitive bids, would you provide information to that extent during the, the discussion at Council? I'm just asking for, in general, would you provide that to Council? Well, I, can, I mean, nor normally we haven't. I mean, I think Will is here. We don't. Uh, there's, there's clear rules around that, and, uh, and you know, I know... Uh, some councils become irritated because we reference Justice Bellamy, but Justice Bellamy set the standard based on what happened in Toronto in terms of where councillors or elected officials should get involved in, in procurement. We're obviously looking at lessons learned and to see if is there room to do that and be more creative. But I can answer on this specific, on this specific procurement, the report that ultimately was approved by council delegating the authority and then which set into motion the procurement process effectively eliminated the opportunity to be able to share that information with council in real time because we were totally exposed because we were still in a, a live procurement process. We hadn't finalized the procurement because we told council even after council approves, we still had work to do to finalize the contract with the preferred pro recommended proponent. Councilor Leeper. Thanks. Um, just one question. I might take a bit to explain. No, the um, the winning bidder had seen its technical submission uh, evaluated, failed to make seventy percent. Um, the, the 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 next level asked them to reevaluate it. Still didn't make seventy percent. But uh, Mr. Kanalakos, you've told us that they have committed to meet the requirements, and I'm I'm looking at all the commitments that they've made in order to uh, ensure that they do meet the needs of the city in this RFP. In in providing the city with the commitment to undertake all these different areas or all these different undertakings that were deficient in their original technical submission. Were those evaluated as rigorously? Uh, who, who evaluated whether or not the committed conformances are, are appropriate or not? 
<clears throat> so we uh, so once the uh, once the decision was made to advance them as the first negotiation proponent, uh, you know, I guess that my, myself and others kind of came out from our our silo and we. Uh, we're able to engage the full en owner's engineering team to look at each of the issues and to, to assess the responses. And uh, so we had the full technical team uh, essentially available to answer specific questions about structure loading and structure design and rehabilitation requirements and, uh, you know, talk to the program the project management people about uh, key individuals and, and, and all of those things. So it was a, a fulsome team that, that did the review to assess you know, the, the updated responses, uh, you know, for example, we had, we engaged with uh, service planning at transit and, and others to look at the station design to say, you know, this ramp only design, does that work for anybody? Is that really achieving the outcomes? And uh, so, you know, where possible, we engage the stakeholders to, to look at the solutions. And that's that's where where we are today in terms of when you look at an Upland station or Leecher and Bozeville, and now they've, they've gone away from the ramps only and Leecher and Bozeville have the stairs, ramps, and an elevator on both sides. Um, you know, the, the outcome is, is bearing itself in the actual designs that we see now. Okay. So the, um, it, it sounds like it was a very good process post-evaluation. Um, is there a question of fairness to the other bidders that they didn't have this same kind of opportunity to, to hone their own technical bids? Madam Chair, the other bidders would have had that exact same opportunity. This is a normal part of every P3 procurement process. The first negotiations proponent stage, the rules are set out right in the RFP, so everybody who participates knows that there'll be this stage where their non-conformances will be negotiated so that they're resolved before, in fact, they're made their preferred proponent. So they would have expected it, and we would have undertaken that process irrespective of which of the proponents had been successful. Okay, so there is no I'd question like of add, fairness. I'd um, from a fairness perspective, uh, the, the price did not change. All that happened, and again, I concur that this is a normal practice as part of P3 projects, all that occurred was that the, there was greater clarity and that you addressed through the negotiation process some of the minor nonconformances. So uh, there's no fairness issue as it relates to other proponents because their bid was enriched and their price was not modified. Okay. No, that's, uh, that is extremely helpful, actually. Um, and then what is the, the mechanism whereby we ensure that they follow through on all of this? What kind of language is written into the final PA? If you look at the last couple of paragraphs of the letter, maybe even the start of the letter, it's indicated that that letter and all of its resolutions form part of what's called the project co-proposal extracts. Okay. So it's actually a binding schedule to the project agreement. All those resolutions must be adhered to as covenants. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're, uh, Councillor Fleury has offered Councillor Meehan to, to go forward with this because you're first time speaking, so feel free. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I, and thank you for um, going through this again with us. I would like to ask about uh, the delegation of authority. And uh, I have been told, uh, actually uh, the Fairness Commissioner mentioned here this evening, that the uh, discretionary clause that was, was disclosed in the RFP, uh, which we all know, but it was more substantive than you have seen in other contracts. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, so um, there, uh, several of the P3s will have discretionary rights uh, that allow the authority to take certain actions. Uh, in other P3 projects, uh, they did not, they don't typically have the list of the bullets underneath. So your three bullets that clearly set out uh, the elements that uh, the sponsor, in this case the city, may take into account. So those elements were clearer uh, than what we would see in other procurements. Okay. Um, Apparently, I'm, I'm told that the discretionary clause is, is part of uh, P3s. And we at City Council have signed discretionary clauses in the past, and, but no, not to the extent that it's been involved in such a mega project. So um, do you think it was fair that we didn't understand just exactly what we were delegating away, Mr. Kanellakis? Um, 
Because we seem to, uh, we, while we do the standard that you, we give you the authority to do things, basically all we were allowed to do at the end of this process was to sign the contract. And you saw councils, councillors time and again over the whole process asking for oversight, asking for, and nobody ever saying, well, we, you have absolutely no right to ask these questions. And everybody seemed to be a little bit confused by the process. So maybe would it have been a good idea to explain just the blanket authority that we had delegated away? Well, I think, uh, Madam Chair, the, the point that uh, Councillor Meehan is raising is, I think, captured in the, um, in the um, uh, yes, Lessons it. Learned report. I think what you're raising is something that we put in the scope of that report because that is the mm -hmm. fundamental issue of why some councillors or councillors feel that, geez, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't know. We hadn't seen the RFP. We delegated authority staff to run the RFP. It wasn't unlike stage one, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but that in the scope document, you'll see that they're looking, what are the best practices um, to uh, bring back to council milestone information or key critical points in the process to inform you? I'm, I'm totally open to looking at that. I don't have a, you know, I'm, I, I come into this kind of um, um, with the view that, you know, we followed a process that we were directed to do, we brought you back the result. But I'm not wed to the process from the perspective that this is my process and it's never gonna change and council shouldn't know. I'm totally open to whatever's permitted or what are best practices to make council feel that they're informed, they, they know what's going on, and it's appropriate. And the RFP was not made public. Um, I guess you would say that you, we would do that, in hindsight we could do that going forward. But we didn't know, city councillors did not know that there was a discretionary clause um, in this until the, we learned about it from the Auditor General in November of last year. And I think, I speak, we were all quite surprised that this existed. And I was sitting around this council table when my colleagues were asking, is there anything, is there anything that we don't know about that would allow a bid to go through if it did not meet the 70% uh, threshold, technical threshold? And that wasn't even revealed to it at, at that point. We were, told, tell, um, we were told no, right? We were told no, there's nothing that you're missing. Well, clearly there was something that was missing, a discretionary clause, but nobody even mentioned that at that point. So, which leads me, maybe I, you know, I just think that, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us? Because I know that all the bidders in the process knew that there was a discretionary clause. So you weren't uh, letting anything out of the bag that would jeopardize any of the other bids. So why didn't you tell us that day that there was a clause that was in there? Because uh, to me, that you were try it was secret. You wanted this to be kept secret. Uh. Madam Chair, with all due respect, I didn't want to keep anything secret. Well, then I, why didn't you tell us? Well, I'm going, about to answer that. Um, because, as I said earlier, and I, I think this is something that you know, I'm going to reiterate, we set out the criteria for how this bid was going to be approved. Um, the criteria did not include council involvement in the procurement process, which was clearly communicated to the bidders before they actually submitted anything to start the process. So you effectively cut yourself out from knowing that information because introducing that information into a live council meeting when the bidders have been told that council is not involved up front would effectively open up the decision-making process of how they ended up being the preferred proponent. So on legal advice, and that day, I know you didn't like it, but on that day, our legal counsel was actually protecting staff and yourselves from the proponents that are lost coming in, reaching in and saying, wait a minute, this is not fair. You've just now opened up the process to something that council had removed themselves from. Is it better though to lie to us? Is it better to lie to us? Because we were told no. Well, quite frankly, uh, I don't recall anybody lying to you, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm offended that you would say well, we're lying. I, we're not, nobody lied. And it's to suggest that is quite frankly I'm, unfair. Am I sorry? I, I I take that back. But I was under the. I if I recall correctly, we were just told we were asked, "Is there anything that we don't know about that would allow this bid to go through?" And the answer was, "No." So okay, I, I'm going to just a point of order on this one. 
you know, our staff, our, our uh, professional um, Thank you, Matt. conscience, uh, and you know, I certainly won't put up with anybody calling anybody a liar in this forum. So, I'd, I'd, I, I'd, okay. I'll take the word so back. So, if you have there a question, a please feel free to proceed with it. But we're just not going to go there. And I know we're all tired. And I'm just looking around the room. I know we're all exhausted. Everybody would like to leave. I think this is a very valuable discussion. Is there anybody who can I'll back me up that with the answer to that question when we asked it at council was there was nothing that we were missing? Is that true? Um, am I am I, rem I not remembering it correctly? It's iffy. Okay. I will take that back, Mr. Kanellakis. Um, we just didn't get a clear answer then to that. Um, but going forward, you'll, we'll know that exactly the extent of what we're delegating away. Um, the, the bidders knew that apparently that we didn't have any input into this. Well, Madam Chair, as I said, um, you're looking at lessons learned. Um, we have heard what council wants. You have, okay. We have a report in front of you that's basically looking at all the things you've asked for okay. and all the things that Councilor Meehan has asked. What else can I tell you? I'm bringing you back a report by third quarter that's going to provide all the answers to you and then you get to make the decision based on the advice of staff and the total, totality of the information you have. We're bringing that back to you. Thank you, Mr. Cadillac. Thank you. Councilor Fleury. Okay, Merci, Madame la Mairesse Adjointe. So I want to go back to why do we put a percentage? It really bugs me. It really bugs me. We all went to uh, high school, and there was a point where you, have to pa you need this amount to pass. And I don't understand why we would set out a criteria and then not respect it. When I read the documents, there's like a, a strength weaknesses for each bid, and I appreciate that that was shared. And then there's the word fatal flaw that comes out. And to me, I don't know how other colleagues felt, but it's like, whoa, wait a minute. And you start reading into it uh, in terms of the technicality of the bids. You say, wait, like there's elements in the, that it'd be the train system control, that it'd be uh, the details of the integration, that it'd be uh, the onboard equipment. There's tons of information that we're not meeting. So I want to know, what options did executive committee face? I see the recommendations, but what was the range of options that the committee had? Are you asking that question of executive steering committee? Yeah. What options? You had your, your recommendations here. Yeah. But did we, did we present a, an array of options? What could... What could the executive committee have done? I, executive steering committee, obviously they chose the recommended path that they could have chose. Um, I, they, they could have chose to not allow the bidder to proceed. Um, they could have abandoned the procurement process and started a new procurement process. There are several hypothetical scenarios that they could have pursued. Uh, the facts and circumstances clearly indicated to the BSC that the recommendation should be made that they be allowed to continue for all the reasons that we've carefully outlined here today. Yeah, can I just clarify something? Sorry, if I may. Um, there were two steps to the technical evaluation. It was the technical conformance done by, I think, up to 70 individual engineers or specialist engineers that then provided a report to the technical evaluators. So, um, and, and Michael can speak more about some of the specific elements that had to be addressed prior, uh, during the first rank negotiation process. But one of the factors we talked about, which was proximity to the score, the second point, which is no material, basically the summary is there were no material technical issues that could not be resolved because that independent team had determined that the technical requirements had been met. Basically, you were dealing, dealing with uh, a difference in 2.75 points. I, well, I think that's about it. That's about it. If I had to summarize it as tightly as possible, I would say, you know, that, that, that those were the considerations. From a layperson, I'm not an, en I'm not an engineer, I'm not a lawyer. The rebidding or re-looking at the score to me as a, I, I know you don't agree with me, but I'm going to no. say it. I think it's an odd process. I just, I know oh, I only, failed. I know I fail them, and still I, I push them through. That's, that's odd to me. I, Madam, Madam Chair, I, just, I can understand how that perception is there and that somebody could come to that conclusion. But I also have to say that we're dealing with people who have done 
you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of procurements across this country, and I have to defer to their advice. When we're there as a team, quite frankly, I'm not talking to a layperson to get advice on how to manage through a $4.6 billion project on behalf of the City of Ottawa. My job as your main public servant is to ensure that you're protected and you have the best possible advice around you in terms of what to do. I received the best possible advice based on a number of factors that I've explained. Ultimately, we made the decision to move them through because we felt we had the best advice. We're lay people too, to a certain extent. I've done a lot of procurements, but none of that magnitude. We, uh, we needed to understand all the risks, including not putting them through. We discussed that. What are our options? Don't put them through, start over. I remember Jeff talking about all those things. It's not about what someone thinks as a layperson. It's about what do people who do this all the time advise us to ensure that the city is best positioned to get what they need out of this procurement process. That's what you have to have your, and I know I'm asking for a lot, but you're trusting experts who, who do this all the time to give you the best advice to keep you out of trouble. There was no rebidding, to be clear. <laughs> I just, and uh, there was, or something we would call sort of bid repair. There was none of that. What we're talking about here is interpretation of the scoring and then moving forward from a process perspective to ensure that those technical non-conformances could be cleared before you go to preferred proponent. That standard in a P3, out, I should say, I, I be careful, in an output-based contract because interpretation of a specification requires technical judgment. So in every design, build, finance, maintain, I've been involved with even design builds, you come out of the out of the evaluation process with the first rank proponent and you get a set of gray areas. Now in those circumstances, they didn't get below the 70, I'd contend to that. But then the point is, you need to then sit down with that first rank negotiations proponent and ensure their interpretation is consistent with yours. And better than that, because you have competitive tension, that's your opportunity to try to make it very clear that you're getting what you want and you're not changing the price and you're not changing the, the project agreement and you're not changing the RFP. You're just holding them to your collective understanding of what they're providing you because you don't have 100% design, it's an output-based contract. So I, I, just, I just want to be clear, I appreciate you were probably just explaining things generally, but there was no rebidding happening here, <laughs> just to be clear on that point. No, uh, maybe uh, it's, eight, it's 8 p.m., so my terminology might be loose. Uh, just, just for the public record, sorry. <laughs> fair enough. Um, so I want to understand, we're, we have not been sued by the other two uh, procurement teams. So there's an NDA of some sort, and we've made the payments. Can you maybe describe to us what that process is? Because if I'm on the other side, hey, these guys don't meet the percentage. I, wanna, I want fairness. So... As part of the process, you have debriefs with the other proponents, which we had, where we walked them through the strengths and weaknesses of their own proposals. Following those debriefs, you present to them a waiver, which uh, where they sign, all the members of their proponent team, everyone who makes up their proponent team signs that waiver. In exchange for participating in the process, those bid teams receive their honorariums. We went through that process, as Mr. Kanellakis explained, we started in uh, April, May of 2019, and we concluded uh, beginning of August, I think, 2019. And all of that was done to those proponents' satisfaction, and they delivered us those signed waivers, and we delivered them the honorariums. And how is the risk any different? Like, if, if in this case, SNC was in selected, would we have done the same agreement with the same amount with them not passing through that filter? Hypothetically, we would have uh, undergone a process with any unsuccessful proponent, and if that had been Transit Next, we would have gone through the same process. So I want to identify, what's the risk? Like, I, what, what's, the, what's the advantages of passing through that filter? Of, hey, they don't meet the threshold. If they didn't meet the threshold, what would have been our risk in the, pro in the procurement process? From a legal opinion perspective, the risk would have been that they felt that the evaluations were not moored to specific RFP requirements and that the evaluators were showing preference that wasn't anchored to RFP requirements and therefore could have mounted a challenge on that basis. Uh, a challenge that was different than the others two that weren't selected in the end? Again, 
the others participated in the process fully, completely, and you know were debriefed, went through the waiver. They, they, and as the fairness commissioner said, I'll let them comment. But the others participated in a process, and and it met their expectations. The exercise of discretion clause was was something that all proponents were aware of, and all proponents understood the circumstances under which it could possibly be exercised, and those were the circumstances under which it was exercised. Okay. Uh, I'll wrap up my comment that for me, when, when we voted, um, we, we asked questions on the process, and now we know the disclosure piece, now we know the going back, yet I'm supporter of phase two. It just feels like it wasn't as transparent as we wanted to, and I wish that maybe it was our, the way we wrote the delegation of authority. I wish we, we would have gone back in camera that you would have explained that process, so then when we made that vote on phase two, we would have known that, hey, here's the final price, because to me it it's, feels very heavily weighted on price alone, and $100 million in the bigger context where I think it's going to be a lot of heavy lifting by Michael and his team to make sure that they're compliant because their bids is, wasn't, I mean, it, it, it's not uh, reluisant, as we would say in French. It was, the other two were really good technically. They were awesome. Maybe the price was different. Maybe it would have given us a different outcome if council would have, uh, would have gone on camera at the time. I recognize what I'm describing as comments, but that's certainly how I feel about it. And I, I hope that the lesson learned report will we'll look into, uh, without political influence in the process, political uh, awareness of, uh, of those decisions. Councilor Menard. I'm on round two, so did uh, Kluche and Luloff want to go first? Do you want me to go? Councilor yeah. Kluche. Okay. Thank you, and I just, uh, I, I just feel I have to speak up, uh, Councillor Meehan and what Councillor uh, um, Fleury just said. And for the last year or so, we've had a, a handful of members of, of Council that have been a little bit smearing the reputation and the professionalism of our, of our staff. And when, when we get an answer, we don't like the answer. And they, they ask the AG to investigate, and the AG investigates, and they don't like the facts presented by the AG and Councillor McKinney, and I'm sorry she's not here, I'm sure she would verify what I'm about to say, on November 26th came to me after the audit committee meeting and said, I'm disappointed in the Auditor General, he doesn't work for us. Never truer words have been spoken. He does not work for individual council members in their agenda. As he said, he, he said, the job of the AG is to say what we found, not what someone wants us to find. Members of council deny facts presented by the Fairness Commissioner, deny facts presented by our managers, procurement professionals, legal advisors. And behind every attack is a little bit of a thinly veiled allegation of wrongdoing and alternative motives. peddling conspiracy theories, if you will. So I, I would ask, after this debate, we're about to go on to item three, maybe, at the end, lessons learned, very important part of this, very important part of the Menard-Watson motion of February 12th, to turn the page so that we could stop attacking. I think that we have the totality of the facts. We released all the documents of procurement stage two. They're there. They're all out there. It's in the interest of our residents. And, yeah, and, and I think, I think, I think it's, it's fair. We've seen it as part of the, the news conference last week that was given by members of, of, of the coalition that, you know, the motives are to, that we don't like P3s, perhaps. In some ways, as, as my colleague to my right has said, you know, is it to cancel stage two because it's a P3? You've just said no. Okay, well, let's have the courage to, to continue with, with phase two 
to make it the best we can to engage in an intelligent debate about the benefits of stage two to our residents, to the city as a, as, as a whole. We want it to extend from Blair to Trim and south to the airport and to Bowesville and west to Bayshore. I think it's time to move on to, after everyone has spoken of course, to lessons learned and to make it the best we can. I appreciate that j'apprécie que le Conseil Fleury vient de dire. appreciate what uh, uh, Councillor Fleury has just said. He supports uh, stage two. That, to say that, to recognize it wasn't a perfect process. Nobody said it was a perfect process. Nobody said that we're on, I recognize we're on LRT stage two. We've dealt with stage one. Nobody said that the rollout of stage one uh, has gone the way, the way uh, we wanted to, and we need to do better, and we will do better, and we'll apply all the conditions to make it better. But th the tone that I'd heard and some of the comments with respect to some of the advice that we have counselors, not professionals, we're not procurement or legal or rail experts, that, that we need to, we too as councillors need to do better for the residents of our city. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Mr. Clerk? <sighs> two, two, two seconds. Yeah, it's not long. You know what? It's. <laughs> I think we're all really tired here. Um, Mr. Clerk, your opinion on that, please. Madam Chair, where a member considers that a member's rights, immunities, or integrity, or the rights, immunities, or integrity of the council as a whole have been impugned, the member may, as a matter of privilege, rise at any time with the consent of the mayor or chair for the purpose of drawing the attention of the matter to council. Upon being recognized by the mayor or chair, the member may state the question of privilege you, Madam Chair, would then determine the question and require whether or not anything further would need to be done. Proceed. I'm only asking the member to remove uh, the word smearing beside my name as I did ask questions of process. I did state my opinion as my concerns as it relates to process, but in no time did I bring an individual member's ability uh, in question. Councillor Cloutier. I don't believe that was beside your name, but absolutely I withdraw that with, with respect to we as a, in, in our questions, I felt have been, have been smeared, all of us, and I apologize then. Okay, thank you both. Councillor Luloff. Did council approve the process that was used for the procurement of stage two? Yes, Madam Chair. Great. Uh, was that vote unanimous? I believe it was, Madam Chair. Did you deviate at all from that process? According to the Fairness Commission, Honor General, we did not. Did the winning proponents meet all of the thresholds, technical, financial, and otherwise, before the contract was awarded? Yes, they did. Wonderful. Okay, why are we still here, colleagues? Look, stage one will never work properly without stage two. We've had three groups of independent investigators and auditors tell us that we got the best deal and that the process was followed. We should not give up on stage two. I have four stations coming to my ward. I didn't vote on the process. But we did vote at the very end, or at the very beginning of our term here on council to go ahead and finish the procurement process that was started by the previous council. I just, like, I, like, I don't know what we're picking at here. Look, are, are there issues with the procurement process? Yes. But did this council approve that procurement process? Yes. So if you have issues with this and you sat on the previous council, look in the mirror. Thanks. Councillor Menard. Thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just, I don't know that the commentary right now around this type of thing is helpful. The public has questions. We have questions. They're legitimate questions. 
Um, they're outstanding questions and people are wanting answers and that's what we're trying to accomplish here by asking questions. So, you know, that's a legitimate role of council. Even though the process may have been approved by a previous council, it doesn't mean that that process was exemplary. And that's why we're doing this now to make sure that anything in the future is changed or looked at in a way that we get the best process possible because this one certainly wasn't. My question is around the RFP document uh, that we had put out for this uh, procurement. In there, it states that if a proponent believes there's any term or condition that in an RFP document that is ambiguous, the proponent can notify, shall notify, the sponsor of that ambiguity. Um, so I'm wondering, did T-Next or SNC-Lavalin notify the city of any ambiguity in the RFP document? Not to our knowledge, no. Okay. It, also in that RFP, uh, there was the ability for council, or excuse me, um, staff to reject bids from companies that were convicted of corruption, collusion, bid rigging, or any other anti-competitive activity. Could SNC-Lavalin have been rejected using that clause? Based on the facts and circumstances at the time, no. Based on the facts and circumstances at the time, no. They hadn't been convicted at there that time? There was no conviction at that time. It was later that the conviction came. I believe the matters of SNC-Lavalin are public record, but yes, I believe they've been convicted now of other things, but at that time they had not. Okay. Um, they fully disclosed in their RFQ the matters that had been brought to their attention at that time in terms of charges and claims. Okay, I think the timeline, the ch I challenge the timeline a little bit. Um, how were you able to communicate to the city manager the, the um, lowest price component to council, but you couldn't communicate the technical score aspect? Uh, we did not uh, communicate the lowest price. What was uh, part of the council presentation a year ago was the budgetary elements of the entire stage two program. I can turn it over to Ms. Jasmine to talk about the things that were discussed, but we did not give the exact final price and we did not give the financial scores. What we did do, and it wasn't myself, it was Ms. Jasmine and, uh, and Marion talked about the budgetary implications, which obviously uh, gave you a picture of what those prices generally were and, and what the impact was, but that was required to consider the matter from a budgetary perspective. Okay, I just, I just want to um, challenge a little bit. We, yeah, we were sorry, told that that was, that was in, the... In, oh, sorry, Ms. Jasmine, yeah, go ahead. In the presentation, there was a comparison to the affordability cap, but just for that proponent, and there was no scores identified from the financial evaluation. No, there were no scores. We were told, though, that this proponent had the lowest financial bid. So how could we be told that? is what I'm asking, but we can't be told uh, about the technical aspects. I think the consideration of the budgetary elements at the time, particularly given that on the Confederation line east-west, as you may recall, there was a significant overage from the affordability caps, which had significant budgetary impacts. And so it was absolutely necessary from budget perspective that uh, Ms. Jasmine and Marion uh, Simula give you all the necessary information to make good budgetary decisions at the time. Yes, but the reasoning that you provided for not giving us the technical score is because you couldn't. You, you, you said that there would be legal ramifications for that. So, is, but there's not legal ramifications for describing the fact that this was the lowest financial bid. In the facts and circumstances under which that information was provided, it was absolutely necessary in order for councillors to understand the budgetary constraints that they were working under and the budgetary constraints that they were facing given the unaffordability of the east-west connectors proposal. Okay, how were you able to communicate to the mayor that SNC-Lavalin did not meet the technical score, but not to the rest of council? The, uh, the mayor is the, uh, of the chair of council um, uh, and is the head of uh, council and under the, I'll defer to Rick, but under the Municipal Act um, uh, has uh, the ability to do, to receive that briefing uh, before he chairs the council meeting. Rick, do you want to offer anything? And the mayor is required as the chief executive officer of the corporation to provide leadership about a variety of things, and uh, the staff thought it was appropriate that he have that information. Did, did you brief any other councillors about that information prior to the meeting? No other councillors were briefed. If we had gone in camera during that meeting, could you have given the briefing then? I think that question was asked, and it was no. No, it could not have been given at that time for the same reasons, whether we were in camera or publicly, 
the RFP did not permit council to get involved in technical evaluation of proponents. Okay. I want to uh, go to uh, the public-private partnership aspect of this because what we're facing now is obviously we're seeing potential legal risks um, associated with LRT. And so I'd like to, to ask, in the uh, decisions to go forward with P3s and a DBFM the way we have, we, we have um, risks taken into account. And in this case, when you didn't look at the risks, it made more sense for the public sector to procure this project. When you took into account the risks, then you said it made more sense for the private sector to, to take on the project. Do you incorporate risk dollar math in terms of rationalizing um, the price when it comes to um, the costs of legal fees or contingencies or investigations of these, sort, these sorts? Uh, Madam Chair, yes. So there's two components to a value for money assessment. The first is the risk matrix. Uh, whereby you would compare each risk and its likelihood and probability of occurrence under your baseline design bid build that's typical versus the option you're considering and this was design build finance maintain the one thing I would point out is that the vast majority of those risks which are not programmatic like for example scope changes tend to be more prevalent under design bid build than p3s but for example some of the issues that have been encountered on the stage one project, geotechnical issues on a tunnel, uh, the, the integration of the system with the, and the manufacturing of the trains, those are not P3 issues. Those are project specific issues. So what you'd see in the, VF, in the value for money assessment is that the, the size of that risk, the value of that risk is proportionate to the cost of the project prior to financing. And then the question you need to look at is, if the baseline of your contract, let's say under design bid build, and I'm not sure what the city standards, if it's a CCDC contract, and the fact that you're procuring each of the pieces individually, you're, doing the, you're, you're getting the 100% engineering design, you're doing all the construction coordination now with multiple contractors on a multi-billion dollar project, you're specifying the train control system, not the, not the contractor, and you are right in the middle of the vehicle manufacturing process, then the question is, who's got the integration and coordination risk under that contract? And that's the primary difference in the risk transfer when you look at uh, an integrated design build maintain versus a traditional project. Then, and, and really that is what we call the retained risk. Are you retaining that risk or not mm -hmm. based on the security that's in the contract and risk allocation? Then you add to that the incremental costs of financing, because theoretically, and at the point you're getting to is, you've got a you've got a private financing structure, and that adds cost. And if that added cost, plus the risk that you've retained or transferred, is lower than the than than the baseline, you've got value. What I would tell you is, if you're if you're seeing projects that have higher risk that aren't P3 based, like you've got a you've got a sinkhole or you have trouble with the manufacturing the vehicles then those risks are just going to get bigger. It's going to make the value for money actually larger, not smaller. But I want to be clear. Is a legal uh, risk associated with the initial value for money a aspect? So I know there's brownfield risk. The, the proponent could find a brownfield. That's a risk. But is it considered in the risk assessment that we could be sued by the proponents either within the RFP phase or or later on, and my understanding is that is not taken into consideration in the value for money. I just want to clarify that. Sorry. <laughs> there are procurement risks. Depending on which risk matrix you use, there are some risk matrices that have procurement risks. In this case, did we use? I think we had it at two levels. Risk? And the one level of procurement would be the injuring procurement construction risk, the one the general contractor is doing. And then the procurement that the authority is doing, that's the programmatic risk I was telling. And I have to go back and look. but. If we were using, uh, I think we were using a second generation infrastructure Ontario template at the time, there probably would have been a pro programmatic type. Now, it wouldn't have been as pedantic enough to say it's litigation based. It's just saying, will you have a failed procurement? And there are a variety of reasons why it may fail. Okay, thanks for that. I think we find ourselves in a situation where the city has taken on a lot of risk in what we've done in the last little while. 
the way projects have turned out uh, with, with stage one, and the uh, risk we took in undertaking the process in this piece for stage two, uh, those need to be measurable for this city going forward. We, we need to do a better job of incorporating those sorts of risks. Had we not taken on a P3, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in in stage one right now. We would not be. But we're there because we took this on in a DBFM, P3, and that, that is, that's the situation we find ourselves in now. So I think we need to really reflect in this city how we go about mitigating the risk to our residents because we've taken on and they're saddled for 30 years now. That's a decision that's been made in both stages and it's a heck of a lot of risk that they've taken on and we've done it in a way that people think that there's, there's quest, it's in a questionable manner. So uh, I hope we really do truly reconsider this going forward, the way we procure these projects. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll just be incredibly brief uh, to point out the fact that, uh, you know, the P3 model was the same model that we used for Stage 1 LRT. And in that model, it did successfully transfer the construction risks and the financial pen penalties for lack of performance to the service provider, to RTG, as it was designed to do. Um, you know, the City of Ottawa also undertook a very successful P3 with the Royal Ottawa Hospital, which has won accolades from many, many outlets. So once again, we, that might be a conversation for another day. We're all incredibly tired. Uh, I would like to extend a, a sincere thank you to city staff, our legal teams here, and the Fairness Commissioners for being here and answering all these very, very important questions. Uh, I think this puts a lot of... Um, perspective on the situation and uh, just to provide some clarity that I think that we were lacking but that we now have. So I'm going to, uh, to say, do we have, for the stage two LRT quarterly update, is that received? Received, okay. So, Mo? Well? The committee five minutes to, uh, for bio break before we go to the next item, otherwise we're gonna lose corn if somebody go to the bathroom. Okay, so I'm going to call a five-minute bio break. So we'll reconvene at uh, 8.35, let's say, just to give everybody a bit of a break.
All right, everyone, we'll get, uh, we'll resume, please. It's like corralling cats. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for first of all for coming back. <laughs> Uh, so, in terms of uh, the next one, we're on number two. Uh, this one is f the information previously distributed, memorandum from the city manager with respect to release of the stage two light rail transit trillium line project procurement documents as directed by city council motion 276 of February 12, 2020. Can we receive these? Received? Okay, perfect. Number three, LRT stage two procurement lessons learned scope. Uh, that Finance and Economic Development Committee recommends Council approve the LRT Stage 2 Procurement Lessons Learned Planned Scope of Work in response to items 3 and 4 from the Motion Substitute for Menard Meehan Motion LRT Stage 2 Procurement. Can we receive this? Or carry? Carry? It's on the lessons learned, yes. Councilor Menard. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I just, very quick, I, I read through these. It looks very good to me. I think you're, you're hitting on the elements that are outside of the, the, the motion specifically that already cover some of the other pieces around delegation of authority. So uh, it's what I wanted to see in terms of some of the uh, analysis. The piece that I want to, if I could just give direction, hopefully it's easy enough, is around the weighting, the weighting of scores within our, um, our purchasing uh, policy, our, our P3 policy, I, I, I understand some of it's outside, but some of it would be hopefully within the lessons learned. Um, so the weighting of scores for me is important to get to get that piece back. Um, and then the, uh, the I wanted to ask a question of staff around the city's, uh, the P3 policy review. That I understand is coming back in the midterm governance review um, for a discussion there. And will you be making recommendations uh, at that midterm governance for, for potential changes or how, how is that uh, going to work? Uh, Madam Chair, the P3 policy will be updated to include the recommendations from the audit of the Auditor General and anything else that would have been derived through the uh, independent review. So the Auditor General's recommendations are part of the lessons learned scope. I, I saw all of, uh, all of them are in there. Um, but the review of the city's P3 policy is a separate item in that in that motion, uh, what's the, our motion, to uh, to specifically look at that uh, that piece, not just not just in relation to the auditor general. I don't think there's language that says it's just on the AG. Uh, if you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Clerk, but that should be a more broad uh, based review. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, perhaps in the interest of time, if that's a direction, we can take it offline and that's come fine. back before Council. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate that, Madam Chair. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Oh, all done? Oh. Councillor King. Thank you. Um, I guess my concerns uh, from lesson learned are really uh, revolve around risk, uh, the idea of uh, systemic risks for certain projects that, that we undertake under these models. I, I noticed that uh, the, the word risk only appeared uh, once in, in this lesson learned scope. And so I was just curious as to um, the consideration that staff will be taking to uh, mitigate and evaluate uh, the potential of technology failure or non-delivery of the uh, services that we are that we are uh, purchasing. So Madam Chair, one of the items that's outlined in the scope of work is a review of the different project delivery methodologies which are based around the allocation of risk. And so as part of the scope of work, there would be a recommendations around how to procure a similar uh, or a second light rail uh, 
project, and so that allocation of risk would be included in that assessment. Uh, I'd also like to underline specifically uh, turbulence risks or those risks that emerge in uh, large-scale projects when we have unforeseen events, which I understand we had a kind of chain of unforeseen events which didn't allow for full disclosure of uh, fulsome uh, disclosure of information to council. Council was really just confronted with, uh, you know, uh, a decision. And I think that uh, often, you know, we need to have a, a more fulsome process uh, in terms of really assessing uh, some of these risks. So would those types of risks also be uh, uh, um, evaluated, not just technology or non-delivery, but also uh, turbulence risks or risks from uh, um, events, unforeseen events? Um, Madam Chair, we'll ensure that these risks are assessed as part of this uh, review. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor El Shantiri. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, I apologize, we didn't hear what direction did you agree to, to Councillor Menard. I'd like to know what the direction is. Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Menard was raising an issue with the weighting of scores being uh, reinserted into the uh, lessons learned, and I asked uh, that if he would like, we would take it offline with the Chief Procurement Officer and deal with it before we got back to Council. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tierney. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, real simple. Um, when we actually look at, at going through procurement lessons, uh, can we have uh, comparators of other municipalities and how they deal with procurement as well? I, I always like going with best practices, and I think that would be a good way to go. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so is this item carried? Carried. Perfect. Seeing that we have no further items, then I call for a motion to adjourn. All in favor? <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone.